On behalf of eLotus, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for choosing Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine as your CEU provider. We have been hosting educational courses for over 20 years and we are proud to be your trusted source for premium CU content. I'd also like to take this time to thank Evergreen Herbs as well as their customers. Because of you, we are able to hold special promotions and events and freebies throughout the year. When you choose Evergreen as your herb provider, you're also choosing to invest in the advancement of TCM. Thank you for being part of this great collective. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Um, the Webinar t the webinar hours are from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and lunch is 1 to 2 p.m. We'll have two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. Cole will let you know when they'll happen and he'll also let you know how long they will be. If you are in if you have if you are logged in more than once, you will also hear an echoing sound. So to resolve those extra echo to resolve the echo, just close your extra logins. And after or after a period of time, Adobe does remove the extra logins because you are only allowed one login per user. So please use just one device. Otherwise, the other device will get um, booted. <laughs> Sorry. And then, so what you are seeing on your screen, on the top left-hand corner, you'll see the video feed. And to the right of the video feed, you'll find the PowerPoint for today's class. Now, the lecture notes are available for download, and you'll find two downloads on the page. One is for six slides to a page and the other is for two slides. And these set of notes are different from yesterday's class, which is the part three of the internal medicine series. So you would need to re-download them. I'm, I'm sorry, you would need to download them if you haven't done so already. And if you, you also you do need to, uh, sorry, I see a question. Do we take quizzes for this, for this course? Yes, you take quizzes for all of our online courses, including today's webinar. The quiz will be available at the end of the day, and I will send an email out as well as go over how to take your take your quiz. Okay, and then so you guys all will get the access to the quiz as long as you attend today's webinar in full, and you also get the four-week video replay period. All right, let's get started with today's class on part two of body mapping, acupuncture, and herbs for emotional, neurological, and rheumatic disorders with Cole McBonwa. The topics covered include neurological brain oncology, aeotrogenic, and musculoskeletal and rheumatic. Cole started learning holistic medicine in 1991. He studied with doctors from a variety of medical traditions, including Chinese, Korean, Ayurvedic, and Himalayan, while traveling around the world. He holds a doctorate in acupuncture and Chinese medicine from the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine. He has worked in a busy public health clinic, private practice, and volunteer clinics using the body mapping acupuncture technique during the last 20 years, and he is here to share that with us. So let's go ahead and give him a big warm welcome. And Cole, just do one last testing before we start. Can everybody hear? Everybody hear the mic? Sounds good. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, eLotus. Thank you, uh, Tina, Donna, Sam, eLotus crew, and um, Evergreen for this opportunity to come talk to you guys today. And uh, I also like to um, say that um, I humbly ask your forgiveness and the forgiveness of our uh, teachers and ancestors who came before us. With that being said, we have lots to cover today, and I would just like to ask if anyone uh, was not there yesterday, can you just type in uh, new if it's uh, new today? Just want to know if I need to review some of the basic stuff for you guys. A couple of you new today, okay. Um, also, can you type in... Um, you know, if you're new to me, so just put, um, you know, new to call or something. Okay. Soon pay. All right. So uh, we'll do a quick, maybe 20, 30 minute review here uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar, uh, been watching all of my stuff. Uh, but here yesterday, great, Nancy. You've seen that all then. <clears throat> Watched a lot. Great. Okay, Mayo, wonderful. So I'm going to review quickly uh, images and um, that kind of thing. 
because we do have a lot to cover. That's right, Donna. <laughs> so uh, we have charts. We have a book uh, found at uh, Evergreen. Um, so chart is uh, basically what I'm calling body mapping. And uh, let's just have a look at where we are in our slides. Oh, interesting, different slides. Okay. okay, well, I can just go through the slides and we're at the beginning, so I'll just have to skip ahead of things we did. So basically, um, you guys probably know about me then, so don't have to uh, give you more of that information. Um, we'll start right with the images. So we have a chart of channels, chart of channel relationships, very important, the relationships that gives us um, latitude slash longitude, if you will, uh, where to go looking for uh, appropriate distal point to treat um, area that's in pain or discomfort. And then uh, we have these various images. So extremities image is a main one, that's arms and legs. Torso image is basically everything else. And then we have an extra image for the head, just in case we didn't want to use, oh, say hand or foot to treat head issues. Uh, and there's also, I put a front and back up there at the top, and that's just a quick reminder that you can treat front to back, and there are some anatomical correspondences, uh, front chest, say, with lower abdomen. For example, uh, pectoralis minor will relate with um, uh, psoas, something like that, okay? So, quick review on these images, um, and then we will move right along. So, uh, first and foremost is the extremity image. Extremity image is just comparing arm and leg. So, um, let me just, I pulled off our uh, lovely skeleton behind us, who is aptly named Indiana Bones by my son's classroom who put him together for me, which was great. But we've got uh, arm and leg here, and so we're just gonna compare and contrast anatomy on arm and leg. So obviously, you can see fingers and toes, hands and digits, right? So fingers and toes relate, as you might think, biggest toe with largest uh, thumb, right? And then we've got little toe with little finger. Everything in between relates wrist and ankles are similar joints, multi-bones, kind of multi-movement. Uh, We've got two lower, uh, two bones in the lower arm, two bones in the lower leg, fibia, tibia, and uh, radius and ulna, right? Those are relating to each other. Uh, elbow is a hinge joint, and knee is a hinge joint, right? Hinge joints relating to each other. And then as we get all the way up to um, our shoulder and hip, ball and socket joints, right? Ball and socket joints. So that's our basic anatomical correspondences for extremities, which works very nicely. And the name pair system, which is uh, those funny Chinese name pairs. So Yang Ming or Xiao Yang or you know Tai Yang, what have you. Uh, the hand and foot of those two are what relate to each other very close to anatomy. So Tai Yang foot relating with Tai Yang hand. Very nice, right? So Tai Yang small intestine channel goes down the little finger down the wrist all the way to the elbow at the back of the elbow, taiyong foot being bladder channel on the foot, down the little toe of the foot, down the side of the foot, all the way up the back of the leg, and you know, in the back of the knee, bladder 40 is gonna relate very nicely with say small intestine eight, yes. So that means needle one treats the other one, right? Okay, so there's a reversed version of this image. The reverse is basically, I like to explain it by numbering our joints. Easiest to see the joints because they're the places that have the most movement. So we've got uh, one, two, and three. I basically like to say that one and three flip. So now whatever wrist was related to, it relates with what shoulder related to. So wrist is now going to relate with hip, right? Elbow, still knee, and now you're gonna have shoulder relating with ankle, which means the hand, if you were to lay this lay this uh, uh, foot, sorry, I'll get the leg. If you were to lay the leg on us like this, if you can, as you can see, ankle relating its shoulder, the foot then continues past shoulder, right, up onto the torso. So you can do, say, uh, foot points, something like that up here in the shoulder area. Same thing works with the, uh, um, hand and arm on the leg. So if we stand up here and show you really quick, uh, let me tilt this down a bit. Right, as we line up our, our arm, we've got ankle relating with L, a shoulder. So there's our shoulder joint at the ankle. So 
Stomach 41, gallbladder 40, those kinds of areas. Bladder 60, going to treat all the way around that shoulder. Again, name pair relationships. So Taiyong treating Taiyong. So bladder 60 is going to treat something like small intestine 10, 9, that kind of area. Uh, knee and elbow still relate, right? Forearm is going to relate with the thigh. And as you come up towards the hip, the wrist joint is going to end up on the hip joint. Hand is now going to come up and on to uh, pelvis. So you got finger areas, something like that up on the pelvis. Also, it explains some of why maybe uh, hand points work for treating sacrum, right? Or treating uh, SI joint, right? Our SI joint point lines right up on the SI joint. Our SI three and four line right up on the sacrum. Lingu dabai line right up in the low back. It's just channel relationships, right? Okay. Also, uh, genitals also in the hand in this way. Okay. Just as an aside note, really quickly, you can line up the leg on itself as well. So the leg itself will reverse on itself. So you could find a distal point on the leg. So let's say we've got our, our leg lined up just, just exactly like this. And let's say we want to reverse the leg on itself. Okay, so now we've got hip relating with ankle. Knee still relates with itself. And ankle relating with hip here. Foot continues up onto the torso. So now you've got gallbladder 41 or bladder 65 some of those distal foot points relating with this pelvic area. Gallbladder 41 then lining up almost exactly with gallbladder 26, which may be exactly why it opens up this belt channel and wherever the gallbladder channel spreads and goes around here, which for me, it's all the way to the lumbar, quadratus lumborum. Uh, and then as you come across oblique, you get uh, iliacus, psoas, uh, down into inguinal ligament maybe, and definitely into the organs of the abdomen, which we talked about fairly at length yesterday uh, with gynecology. Okay, there's our first one. Questions on the first image? So far, so good, everybody? Second image, really quickly, is a uh, torso image, which means uh, everything else, and we're going to put everything else onto an arm or a leg. Easiest way to see this is uh, hand up, uh, related as the head, the wrist joint movement would be our neck movement, right? Side, side, front, back, all the, you know, kind of movements that we could do with our head and neck. As you go down the forearm, that's going to be upper chest and back. Where we bend now at the waist, that's going to be our elbow area. And then as you continue down the, for, down the uh, arm here in the humerus towards the hip joint, uh, sorry, shoulder joint, that's going to be lower abdomen, lower lumbar as it goes down and ends up at the pelvis. So then the genitals would be up onto the shoulder area. LI-16 becomes an interesting genital kind of a point that you could use large intestine opposite clock with uh, kidney. Using these torso images, we often like to use clock opposite. If you can see that on the chart, I gave you a little hint there right here next to torso. So it says clock opposite. Not 100%, but 90, 95% of the time, clock opposite is the choice for me when I'm doing a torso image. And uh, leg does the same thing. So um, foot would be like a head, right? So if we hold our leg up here, foot is going to be similar to a head like this. The heel, uh, similar to the occipital area, things that are attaching at the heel, things that are attaching at the occiput, uh, occiput very similar tissues, those Achilles tendon points here into the back of the Achilles tendon, treating the ligament, being a tendon or ligament, treating the ligament or tendon running up and down the spine, the nuchal ligament, I believe it's called, and the little ligaments maybe uh, in between the joints of the cervical spine there, very useful to treat through here. And if you thread, put it all the way through to the bone, hit the back of the tibia, say, now you're getting some even cervical bones. So very nice points for treating this area of the neck, right? Um, of course, all the neck points here relate. Spleen, five and a half, liver, five, liver, four and a half, gallbladder, 39. Uh, those kind of points all working to treat these muscles around the neck with our clock opposite relationships, correct? Okay. As we continue down this uh, leg and get to the knee L area, that knee again relates with L2 or navel level. So that's, that's our um, uh, quadrus lumborum. Uh, lumbosacral kind of uh, fascia and tissue there. Uh, further down, going up the uh, femur now, all the way to the hip joint, is going to be that lowest part of the abdomen in the image. Uh, 
typically we'll reverse these images around so we won't use that so much to treat that lowest lumbar, but you could. The image is there. Okay, let's do a quick reversal of this as long as we're all following along. So now we're going to reverse our image. And so in this version, um, we're going to reverse just like we did before. So we're going to number our joints. Let me do it with my arm first. So we have one, two, and three. The one and two reverse. So now whatever uh, wrist related to is going to be shoulder relating to. And wrist, if you remember, was relating with neck. So now shoulder joint, the movement, will relate with neck, which means head will come up onto right the upper back here and chest area, head here, neck, upper torso to navel level. So the torso lines right up across this direction. So there's a couple of points here, large intestine 12 and 13 area. If you're familiar with some of Dr. Richard Tan's work, uh, those line up opposite clock right, with torso image opposite clock with kidney. So you could, it, they treat kidney channel either, you know, central chest or uh, maybe up the inside of the spine. So they're very nice spinal points. If you have, say, a pregnant woman who you don't want to be using lingu dabai on because contraindicated, uh, large intestine 12 and 13, nice option for spinal pain for a pregnancy uh, type patient. You don't want to worry about those uh, contraindicated points. Uh, navel level again at the elbow and then lower torso, lower abdomen. So this PC6, triple warmer 5, lung 7, heart area, treating this lower abdomen now. So some of those points, PC6, triple warmer 5, maybe treating spleen channel, stomach channel in the abdomen when we talked about gastrointestinal issues, when we talked about some of our gynecological issues, treats gynecological issues as well. Spleen channel running over the ovaries, stomach channel running over the uterus to some degree. Uh, so useful points for those kinds of situations as well. Uh, wrist being the end of the pelvis, and then hands become very conveniently genitals for men external, for women as if it's folded up and inside internal. So genitals for both men and women, even though the women seem to be more up in the abdomen, useful to use the hand as well because it has a folded image up and inside. Okay, great. Leg does exactly the same thing. Uh, reversing ankle and shoulder get our bend correct, ankle and shoulder reversing. So now uh, shoulder, uh, an uh, ankle and shoulder, reversing ankle and hip, sorry, uh, hip joint now relating with neck, which means head up onto the pelvis, okay? Head, head is on the pelvic area. So head's going to relate with, with these pelvic bones, right? The flat of this of this area on the pelvis it's going to be relating with head area, gallbladder 30, going to be relating with gallbladder channel on the side of the head. Nice point for headaches, possibly. That would be same side, same channel versus clock opposite. Clock opposite gallbladder would be heart. Obviously, no heart point in this area. That would be on the hand or or somewhere else. Uh, so as we go down the torso, neck being shoulder joint, as we go down this upper back, we're coming down to navel level at the knee. Again, that bladder 40. But now you've got uh, maybe thigh bladder points you could be using to treat upper back issues if you wanted to. Again, the reversing image works just fine. So uh, as we continue down the torso, lower abdomen is going to be lower leg. So that's going to be below navel. So now those lower lumbar, these bladder points in the back of the calf, very useful for treating this lowest lumbar, right? Bladder 57, 58. I'll often just call it bladder 58, but it's not a very specific location for me. It's sort of a, <laughs> it's basically the entire calf muscle. So you can just choose, palpate, or just, just figure out your zone, right? So you've got navel being at, uh, at, at bladder 40. You've got bladder 60 being right, right at the base of the pelvis, maybe SI joint around bladder 60, and then you just sort of divide it up. So, okay, it's L, L, that's L2, so L2. 3, L4, L5, like that. So you got L3 area in here, L4 area in there, L5 area down there, SI joint right at the base. So that's sort of a, a way of, of, you know, where on that calf do we needle to treat the area here? Again, bladder channel treating itself would be same side, same side. Bladder treats itself, same side. Same channel, same side. And then just like with the hand uh, ending uh, – here, the, the hand was genital, same thing with the foot. Foot's genital, again, for females curved up inside. Either way, uh, the liver three, the gallbladder 41, the kidney two, kidney four, uh, spleen uh, three, four, all of those are going to be useful points um, to treat uh, genital issues depending on the channel you're trying to affect. 
okay? Reversed uh, images on torso, okay? Moving along, we don't want to take too much time on this. Uh, last one is we have an extra option for the head. So extra option for the head is whole head on the leg. So forehead, uh, as, you, as you look at the leg, we've got uh, this. It's basically from ankle to hip. So forehead area being thigh. Eyes of the knee being just like eyes. Nose, tibial tuberosity. So stomach 36, spleen 9, very nice for sinus. Talked about that yesterday. As you go down the face, mouth is basically right in the middle of the shin, lower shin, kind of stomach 38 to 40 area. Open mouth with a tongue in the middle. So you've got upper jaw, lower jaw, and tongue right in the center. So if there's uh, taste issues, uh, speaking issues, if it's tongue related, not if it's brain related, then you've got some, some options with the stomach channel there. Stomach treating itself, stomach treating large intestine, young ming, et cetera. And then chin ends at the bottom of the ankle. Arm does the same thing. So uh, top of the head, forehead here, eye level. And very similar eye level. We talked about face a little bit yesterday. Eye level, we've got uh, opposite clock. Typically, we're going to use as well uh, with head image. And so opposite clock, we've got on the, around the eye, there's gallbladder on the side, stomach, bladder, gallbladder opposite clock with heart, stomach opposite clock with pericardium, bladder opposite clock with lungs. So you've got all points around the eye right there on the inside of the elbow, yin points treating yang channels, and it even closes like an eye. It's The image is gorgeous. As you continue down the face, uh, nose level at LI10, mouth level somewhere between PC5 and 4, and again, open mouth, tongue in the middle. That's probably my favorite point for tongue and, and, and mouth and sinusy issues right there on the pericardium channel. Beautiful points. You can get them very deep for those deep sinus problems. Uh, and then chin ends right at the wrist, okay? So there's our image for head on the arm. Of course, the image is reverse because why Why would we not want to confuse ourselves with more options? Uh, so again, the ankle and the hip uh, flip around. So now top of the head at the ankle, forehead at the lower leg, still the eye level. Now the nose is about spleen 10 or stomach 34. As you continue down the mouth, mouth is going to be sort of mid-thigh. Chin will end here at the hip. Arm does the same thing. As we're looking at the arm this way, we've got top of the head here. So now this heart seven, lung nine area treats vertex headaches, not just occipital ones, right? Very useful for the double when you have a patient with not only bladder channel vertex headache, but bladder 10 pain, bang, lung nine, get them both, opposite side, of course, opposite channel. As you go down the face, right, eye level still uh, at the elbow, right? There's all forehead, eye level at the elbow. Then you've got uh, nose level here, mouth level sort of mid uh, area there, and then chin ends at the shoulder. Okay. I will review that, Leslie. Thank you very much. Um, great. Uh, lastly, front to back really quick is literally uh, front to back. So mostly used for rib issues, for uh, uh, spinal problems. So uh, rib and spinal issues, we're going to go directly front to back. So, so let's say you have some lumbar pain right on the spine. Uh, even musculature, you can go front to back, same side. So uh, front to back, cervical uh, CV points in front of dew points. Uh, you've also got, uh, or, or a GV, you've also got uh, bladder channel, kidney channel right in front of it. So you can use kidney to treat bladder front to back in the muscles. That can be useful, especially if the pain's right on the attachment at the spine. Sometimes those, those kidney points, even between kidney and CV, very useful areas to uh, get a little stimulation, get the muscle to grip with the needle, and it'll release these attachments along the transverse process, spinous process. All those little multifities, spiraling little muscles going up and down uh, the, the spine, those, those erectors. Uh, ribs, same kind of thing, front to back. So if there's front rib pain, you can needle towards the back ribs. Again, we're going transverse on these needles, nothing going into the lungs. Everybody, that's the biggest cause of uh, death from acupuncturists. We'll cover that later this afternoon. Iatrogenic disease. Uh, and then, uh, again, if there's rib issues in the back, front ribs, again, we're needling sideways. Typically, to treat a rib, I'm going uh, below the rib, at the rib, and above the rib, three needles for one rib. Uh, and right where the rib joins the sternum, you can kind of dig your needle in there a little bit and get some stimulation right at that juncture, get a little cartilage, and uh, that seems to really affect, especially if it's rib. If it's the musculature, well, you're kind of in the muscles on either side, intercostals. So uh, so that's those. 
Okay, that's our front to back image. Really quick, uh, when do we go opposite? When do we go same side? Um, so if it's using image, if it's using channels, one of these channels, uh, clock opposite or name pair channels, then it's opposite side. If you're using same channel, then it's same side. Same channel means gallbladder channel headache. If you're using a gallbladder point, it's like you're draining down the channel, right? So like, let's say our uh, Mr. Indiani here's got some some headache here on the gallbladder channel. If we're going to use uh, that whole long channel all down the same side, it's not really crossing over the body midline. So if we want to treat gallbladder channel, we got to go down on that same foot to find a gallbladder point. And uh, so so that's why same channel, same side. It's almost as if uh, there's a funnel and it's blocked up and you're just pulling out something that's stuck and so then it can just drain, right? You could almost call that channel draining, you know, just running down that same channel all the way down. Uh, so images all still apply with same channel, same side. Very good. Okay, everybody? Quick review? Yep. Great. I know there are other uh, images. Ton had a whole bunch of things he did where he did opposite side this, same side or opposite side. Um, I found with my experience that uh, the channel relationships work best opposite side. Uh, same channel works best, same side, and I leave it leave it at that. I know there are other channel relationships. There's there's branching channels. There's they get all very interesting and 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 uh, fascinating. And there's the I Ching stuff that's that's amazing, and I love the I Ching, uh, but it doesn't it just doesn't seem to pan out for me clinically. So I went to very simplified, only two channel relationships. Keep it real simple. Name pairs for extremities, opposite side. Clock opposite for torso and head images, opposite side. And that's it. That's where I stop. I get about 90% results with that. If those don't work, uh, pretty much nothing else is working either. So, uh, not sure what you mean there, Karen. What if you used stomach channel, still same side? I don't know what that means. If it's stomach channel problem, stomach channel, same side, great. Okay. We're moving along, guys. There's our images, again, of relationships. Again, we don't care about the time of the day. We care that the relationship exists on opposites. Full chart. Okay. Find We find that anatomy tends to be more effective if we can figure it out than the channels. So follow anatomy when possible. And um, those are examples we covered yesterday. We will skip over those and get right to the meaty stuff. Is there a way I can go through all the way until where we stopped yesterday, Sam. The dermatology section should be slide number 200 or 300 something. I will just skip through, I suppose. Bear with me a minute, guys, while I get through. We got there. Neurological, a little too far. Oh, they're in today's already? Oh, darn it. I don't need yesterday's section. We're great. I didn't know we were on today's already. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, you guys saw the, the examples from yesterday. We just did a couple of little ones. Awesome. <clears throat> the notes are not in today's PowerPoint. Uh, I didn't, I, let me just check really quick and see where we're at with our, I didn't look through, I'm sorry. There's the pulse. Yeah, straight to neurological. Um, uh, I don't think we did dermatology yesterday. Um, let's add add some. Let's uh, throw in. Let's put in the dermatology. Uh, we could do it uh, later after the. We'll do neurology first, I guess. I was going to do dermatology first. I have a. What well, we can always do our example patient uh, after lunch. Yeah, very sorry, Donna. I wasn't clear about that. So, like here we said day three. It's got dermatology on the first day. You're right. So sorry. As I as I looked at the number of slides, uh, it looked like that was a good breaking point. It was after the um, endocrine. Awesome. So we'll just go with what's on there now. Um, we didn't do psychological. We didn't do 
dermatology yet, I think. Okay, yeah, let's put up the derm. Um, gosh, I wish I had a... We're going to pull up the dermatology section right now then. Okay, thanks. Let me see what... I might have gotten off on my numbering system from yesterday. Let me just pull that up really quick. Sorry, everybody. Bear with us. A little confusion on uh, so many subjects to cover, <laughs> right? Let's see. Right. So, yeah, we covered 221 slides yesterday. So I would like to do today uh, psychology and derm and then go and then everything else. So um, it was just there was so much in those first uh, those first three. So sorry to confuse you, uh, Donna. Yeah. So I think um, on the whole package I sent you, it's like slide 222 starts with psychological. But we can do derm first if that was if that's what you pulled up, and then we'll go to psych after. Okay, great. <clears throat> I was thinking I was left out a whole bunch of slides or something. <laughs> All right. Yes, we might talk about that gene. Um, I, I, I honestly don't, um, I don't know where the research is on that. It looks like we don't have a ton, but um, we will address autism a little bit. And um, there, may, there may be injury involved in that. And I think that um, there's so much money involved uh, and, and politics involved. It's tricky uh, to, to suss out what exactly is um, the truth of it. And there definitely are people injured by vaccines. It's just how many, and um, is it an, is it uh, worth the greater good <laughs> to do it? And there's the question. Uh, so that's that's what I think we all struggle with. Okay, Durham first, and then we'll if we can add in the psych section maybe after the break or something, Donna, that'd be great. The psych, it looks like it's before the dermatological. So just let me know when you want to do it, okay, and then I'll it. pull up the slide. Yeah, let's do it after the dermatological section. Perfect. Otherwise, I'll run out of stuff to say, guys. Great. So can I make this a bigger screen somehow? There it is. Hey, good job, guys. Perfect. OK, dermatological first, guys. Perfect. <clears throat> so we're going to cover acne, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis. Uh, those are the main ones that I saw. There, of course, are many, many conditions we could work on. We've talked about uh, like shingles, herpes zoster in previous seminars. So we'll focus on these three for today. Um, also, uh, quick, Donna, does this mean that um, the participants don't have these slides? Correct. They don't have the slides, but I so I need to work on them and add them to today's lecture notes, and I'll let everyone know when they're ready for download. Okay, so if we can, yeah, add the psych section in too. Basically, from where I left off yesterday, just go. Okay, sounds good. Great. Thank you, Donna. Perfect. You guys are great. On the fly changes. I love it. So good at... <clears throat> 
What's that? I know I'm difficult. I'm very difficult. My wife tells me that often. Hey. <laughs> it's a joke, joke. Okay, so acne. Great. Some people have them from yesterday. Okay, on we go. So first of all, uh, let's see, etiology, pathology for acne. So this is kind of how I cover it for those of you who weren't here yesterday. I kind of go through sections. So we go sort of etiology and pathology. Then we go um, into symptoms, risk factors, uh, allopathic uh, diagnosis, diagnosis that I like to use, and then uh, various kinds of treatments. Talk about channels and images, go through points I like to use, maybe talk about why. Usually we talk thoroughly in the first one of that section because the points basically stay the same uh, because we're treating by location. So once once we uh, kind of explain out why we're using the points we are and what the images and channel relationships are, uh, then we can go into herbal treatment, uh, some lifestyle nutritional stuff, and uh, that's all uh, and everything's uh, that's as evidence-based as I can find it. So really quick, I will show you some of the uh, sources I'm using. Um, first and foremost is Mr. Dr. Greger. He has a book called How Not to Die, Michael Greger. Okay, he has a website called nutritionfacts.org. And uh, everything on there is free, which is fantastic. And uh, he basically just reads research every day, all day, and reports on it. And whatever the research shows is his opinion. So if the research changes, then he goes to, uh, and then he changes his mind on whatever the option is. He's got a list of what he thinks you should be including in your diet every day. It's called his Daily Dozen. I like his opinion on that, and um, I would recommend that. I recommend that to anybody who asks. <clears throat> Great. Also, we've got uh, the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians. This is by Dr. Barnard. It comes out of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They also do um, CEUs on nutrition, which is great. And um, great guy, fascinating stuff. Yesterday, we talked about diabetes. He's got a good diabetes book. See yesterday for that information. And lastly, but not leastly, is uh, the China study by Dr. Campbell. Uh, he is out of Cornell University, and they have a um, nutrition studies program at Cornell University, which I went through, and it's wonderful, um, and it's good for everybody. So patients can take it, lay people can take it, lots of information, and it's fantastic. So that one's great too. So those are the three main sources. Occasionally, if I couldn't find information in their books, I went to uh, like uh, something um, – like a Harvard Medical or a Mayo Clinic to get a basic information on a particular disease. Um, and then uh, a lot of the nutritional information, some of it came out of the, the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians, some of it came out of Dr. Greger's website. I basically have scoured through the, the best doctors I know and summarized it for you guys and then put links on where to go find the information yourself and you can go watch uh, Greger's videos and uh, that kind of thing. So... Hopefully, you find that as fascinating and interesting as I do, and on we go. So, acne, most common skin condition in the United States, 17 million um, people affected. Uh, genetic uh, is a huge factor. Hormonal abnormal abnormalities are really common, and clogged follicles, of course. Uh, basically, you get skin eruptions. Sometimes they're open, sometimes they're closed. Increased androgens in the body leads to the sebaceous glands, which are the fat-secreting glands, the oil-secreting glands, uh, growing uh, and then increasing too much of the oils, and then that breaks out onto the skin. The dirtier the skin, it seems, clogs up the pores and doesn't let the sebum out, and then it gets infected, a ripe place for bacterial growth in that lipid-rich environment. Uh, and that those bacteria is call, are called Propion e bacterium acnes, which is a fantastic name, if you didn't know. And uh, face, upper back, neck, chest, and upper arms are the most common areas. Risk factors are, uh, of course, using things that you put on your face that block up those pores, like cosmetics. Uh, the oils and the dyes in those don't help any at all, uh, of course. Uh, repetitive skin trauma can do it, so places that are covered, like if you're wearing a mask a lot, that's going to cover areas that are going to increase acne lesions there in those areas. But helmets are common. Other types of clothing that might cover pieces of the face would do it. Uh, environmental exposures make it worse. Um, yeah, i got to memorize that word. I know. Isn't that funny? 
Uh, drugs, steroids, lithium seems to make it worse. B vitamins look like they can make it worse. Uh, milk seems to be particularly um, problematic, probably the hormone in the milk, really. Um, if you could think about lactating cows, they must have hormones in them to be lactating to begin with, so no getting around it. Um, genetic stress and hormones play a role. Medical professionals usually are looking at uh, the history of the patient, doing a dermatological exam, of course, and they're checking for a polycystic ovarian if it's not in adolescence, uh, because hyperandrogenism will lead to uh, some, some acne. Basically, you could have any kind of pulse on these patients. Um, earlier, there was a section on uh, pulse and abdominal palpation. We covered those pretty thoroughly yesterday. If you guys want me to go through that really quick, again, review, uh, I can. So type in there if you want me to cover abdominal palpation again or HARA uh, diagnostics and pulse diagnostic. But I'll, I'll just hit it a little bit as I go through. Um, review that again a little bit, okay? Let me skip. Let me see if it's backwards in here. Oh, there's psych, so we'll go way back. So um, let me just cover it briefly, and then we've got the psych section up here too, so that's great. So uh, really quick, the version of abdominal palpation I use is this chart. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. It's also in our book. This is the chart I like, right? So as you can see, we've got heart uh, right under the xiphosternal notch. Then you have stomach, basically at stomach 12. Uh, spleen is right at the navel and a little bit around it. Uh, kidney is below on the CV channel. Liver is on over the liver itself. There's also a liver crossing on the other side of the lower abdomen. So left lower abdomen has liver crossing area. I think that's has a Japanese term. Someone can type that in if they know it. Uh, large intestine is on the large intestine, ascending and descending colons right there. The lung area I also will call immune. So that's the immune zone. It's right over the appendix. There's also ovary and psoas right there. So um, got to be a little tricky in trying to figure out what exactly you're palpating that's tender. And then the spleen again, has another section that's right over the spleen itself and over the pancreas. So each of these has a release point. Uh, the heart release point is pericardium 6, bilateral. The spleen, uh, stomach release point is stomach, uh, also uh, pericardium 6, bilateral. Spleen release point is spleen 9, bilateral. Kidney release point uh, is kidney 6, but my version, uh, low kidney 6 under the talus, which I demonstrated yesterday, and um, I can show you kind of where it is today if you missed that one. Uh, that's also uh, also bilateral. Then if you're one-sided, if it's liver over the liver itself, that gets uh, liver 4, spleen 5 area for me. It's kind of a zone, and I usually thread that under the tibialis anterior tendon towards stomach 41. Also demonstrated that yesterday. Uh, that one uh, treats on same side, uh, treats liver either liver zone, same side. So if it's over the liver itself, liver four uh, on the same side. If it's over the liver crossing syndrome on the left lower quadrant, also liver same side, four. They are listed in the book and they are on that slide if you can um, see it. You'll also see them come up during the treatment section where we're talking about points and then I'll say hey, that's, the, that, that's the liver four again for the liver zone, right? Uh, the large intestine zones, uh, ascending and descending colon, treated with stomach 36 and 37, I like the combo there, almost always use them both. Uh, pretty deep needles, pretty much right on the classic locations. 37 might be a little closer to 36 than the traditional location. Uh, the lung point or immune gets opposite side large intestine 10, but more towards large and triple warmer or triple intestine, as some might like to call it, triple intestine 10. I do find it a little bit more towards triple warmer channel than most. Uh, and then the spleen upper quadrant over the pancreas and spleen itself get same-sided spleen 9, and the middle spleen gets same-sided, uh, bilateral spleen 9. So I think that covers everything. Um, so again, book has it, or we talked about it thoroughly yesterday. Also, there's that slide probably earlier in the slide sections um, if you need to refer to that. Okay, on we go. 
Uh, pulse wise, I basically do a three jowl pulse. And uh, what I like is finding uh, upper jowl in uh, the upper position, middle jowl, lower jowl. So just like where the organs are. On the right hand side, that's going to be uh, lung and large intestine. Even though the large intestine is in the lower jowl, what I find is this pulse of large intestine mostly finds large intestine channel on the face. So when you take that superficial pulse, it's large intestine channel. And what you're really feeling there when someone has a cold or a sinus infection is you're feeling the channel effect of the wind invasion in the face or in the sinuses or in the teeth, what have you. So if I find a really superficial wiry pulse there, they either have a cold, they have an uh, infection in their sinus, or there's something going on with the teeth, uh, typically. Uh, if, they, if it's not one of those, then I get confused. Occasionally, there may be like a reversal of this image, and that's lower large intestine. Maybe it's a hemorrhoid-ish type situation. But typically, I'm going to roll my finger towards the lower jowl to find that lower part of the large intestine channel. Uh, also, there are four layers for me. So it goes yang above yin, because yin sinks, yang rises, right? So you got yang channel, channels, again, more energetic than organs. Organs, yin, channels, yang. So channels are on top, and yang is on top. So you have yang channel, yang organ, and then yin channel, and then yin organ. So there's four depths, really. Uh, the middle two depths get a little uh, confused. So between the yang organ and the yin channel, they kind of blend a bit. They're, they're a little tricky to, dif ref, uh, to differentiate. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, where do I put exactly my finger? I actually find the styloid, and I go a little bit distal to it. So I'm slightly distal to the styloid, I guess, is where I like it. Um, but it is, uh, it's, but I don't have the styloid between my two fingers, right? So the styloid isn't between. The styloid is mostly... I'd say two-thirds of my finger is is of the index finger is on the styloid, and the the distal third towards the thumb is off the styloid. That's where I would put my finger um, to make it confusing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and then the other fingers just fall on line. Okay? Same thing on the other side. So on the right hand, we've got lung large intestine, or large intestine, then lung, right, as you're going deeper. Stomach, then spleen, as you're going deeper. And finally, um, uh, I take it from the five element system a little bit here. The They call it uh, triple energizer and then CS, standing for circulation sex, which I find to be very accurate in uh, figuring out what's going on in the reproductive organs, whether it's men or women. So it's ovaries and uterus. Uh, it's how much blood is in the uterus. You can feel in this position, this lowest chur position on the right side, or also um, prostate uh, prostate infections or some kind of tumor, something in the prostate, you'll feel something there as well. Also, it's adrenal uh, for the triple. So, so yang being triple warmer above it, and sometimes I'll do triple warmer and PC, pericardium. Uh, but really, I'm, what I'm talking about is the CS, the circulation, sexual organs, and um, what's going on in those. So also hormones in that deeper level. On the other side, of course, we've got uh, small intestine and heart, uh, heart being the actual organ itself, versus uh, Shen type thing. Uh, then we've got, uh, of course, gallbladder liver. And then here's bladder and kidney down here. Sometimes you'll get a pulse that crosses from one side to the other. So if they have a really lots of low back pain and you press on bladder channel and bladder channel is really wiry and hard, you'll get a crossing over and you'll feel it on the other side as well wiry. And it doesn't mean the triple warmer or the adrenal is really wiry. Could be. But sometimes it's because the, the low back is is transferring to the other arm. Sometimes heart will do the same thing. You'll feel heart pulse being maybe hesitant or sharp or nodded, showing heart attack, heart congestive failure, something um, stagnant. Uh, and you'll feel that also on the lung uh, organ. Now, that could be because uh, the lung also has that stagnation, or it could just be heart transferring. And so we have to try to figure that out as we feel it. So, uh, also, the wiriness. Sometimes you'll feel wiriness, of course, uh, in the gallbladder channel, gallbladder organ, wiry, yang, and it'll transfer over to stomach, uh, same jowl. So, but usually the transfer is in the same jowl. Although, sometimes when uh, you're feeling that sort of heart stagnation, uh, hesitancy with like a heart attack patient, um, the, all the pulses will be hesitant, right? It'll be a systemic thing, and sometimes those patients, it's, it's hard to feel the individual organs because there's one pulse that just pervades everything. Uh, and I can't really feel through it. So uh, that's my uh, little pulse thing in a nutshell without getting too too deep into it. So 
In this case, with acne, we're looking mostly at face, so large intestine channel going up onto the face, stomach channel going up onto the face, and we're looking to work on those channels. And here's our face. Let me get my little pointer out. So areas most effective, of course, are going to be uh, large intestine channel uh, around the mouth and nose, right? And then we've got stomach channel uh, along under the eye area. And then forehead is really common. So you've got some gallbladder channel, some bladder channel, possibly a little stomach eight. But to me, stomach eight is pretty high here. So usually the acne is kind of in this level where the hair kind of comes down and touches uh, on the skin. Excuse me, you get a little bit more uh, acne kind of irritation happening there. So not so much on stomach channel, but definitely more bladder, gallbladder. Uh, it's right in between, it's bladder. Bladder for me doesn't go too much wider than bladder two. So pretty much once you get past bladder two, uh, you're on gallbladder for the rest of the eyebrow and above it. All that's gallbladder. Uh, and then occasionally you'll see somebody who's got a little bit around, you know, triple warmer channel, which is right at the temple from triple warmer 23 all the way to the ear and all around the temple. That's pretty common. Uh, and then, of course, all on the jawline is stomach channel. Um, and that's the, mo that's the most of it. Okay. okay. Again, we have people who are getting in the upper back. and uh, But we're treating by channel and by location. So we're going to find our – we're on the head, so we're going to go clock opposite. And we're going to be either head image or we're going to be a whole, a whole body image on the arm or leg, which means hand or foot is going to treat head or the whole head on the arm, and eye levels at the elbow, remember, forehead up here. So you might have upper arm points, you might have lower arm points if you reverse the image. So we've got a number of options there. Let's get rid of that pointer really quick. <clears throat> Run backwards a little bit. Okay. As far as the abdominal palpation goes, we may be finding uh, anything, really. Uh, if they're having a lot of infection going on in those, then we're really going to be finding the immune zone or the lung area, which is that lower right-hand quadrant over the appendix being probably the most reactive because the immune system is so active. And it turns out that there's a ton of immune tissue uh, and all, a whole bunch of good bacteria that are kind of storehoused in our appendix. And it made so much sense to me when I, when I had finally read that and heard that, that um, one of the thoughts is, uh, what's the appendix doing there? And one of the ideas is that uh, if we were to get something like cholera that wipes out our intestinal system, our all of our intestinal bacteria just completely b shot, um, it's kind of like a seeded storehouse, and then it can kind of reseed our intestines with good, good bacteria. It makes a lot of sense. And uh, especially being right at the ileocecal valve where the large intestine and small intestine meet, it could feed both sides. Also, maybe there's enough lymph tissue in there to take care of infections that are happening or to stop an infection that's going up the large intestine uh, from our, you know, from our, our open hole, uh, up the large intestine, infecting all the way, and then stops at the appendix, where the appendix kind of takes over and takes over the infection, and then it stops and doesn't invade interior organs like small intestine. <clears throat> that just sound like really good ideas to me. So good reason that that would be an immune area to palpate for how is the immune system doing in general on somebody? What's the lymph doing? How is the appendix doing? <clears throat> Even if somebody doesn't have an appendix, still seems to react. And maybe that's the ileocecal valve doing that. Uh, of course, if there's a scar there, we want to look at that and see if it needs addressing. <clears throat> uh, allopathic uh, treatment-wise, typically meds, you know, are used oral or topical. <clears throat> and as we continue on here, uh, treatment-wise um, for acupuncture, the way I'm going to address it is I'm going to treat it by the area. So this one's going to take a little bit longer. <clears throat> with Har, you're looking at looking for reactions with palpations. Laura, yes, exactly. So what we're looking at is um, – is, uh, tighten tenderness on these areas. Occasionally, you'll find empty if it's really deficient. So uh, yesterday, we were talking about infertility. If you're dealing with gynecology and you're palpating that kidney zone uh, at the uterus and the uterus is just totally empty and devoid of, of you know, nourishment, it's going to sink and be empty instead of tight, stagnant, tender, right? So you could have some emptiness in these abdominal zones as well. But typically, 
our country being so well fed, everything's stagnant. We're, we're very, very little true deficiency going on here. Everything's just stuck. So tight tender is classic for almost everybody. And the, the, the is that few percentage that you'll find the weak. Uh, so we're looking for that immediate change. You put the point in, uh, in this case, uh, that um, say liver four or LI10, if it's the immune area, and then you, you need only LI10 or triple intestine 10, you know, just a little bit off of LI10 towards triple warmer channel. One needle, maybe two needles, and then go back and check it should be an immediate change like everything else that I like to do, looking for that immediate change. If it doesn't get it right away, I go back and make sure my location is right, the stimulation is right, the depth is right, uh, the patient felt it, but it's not terribly uncomfortable. Go back and check again. If it still hasn't changed, then I start trying to figure out, especially in that immune zone uh, or lung zone, is it ovary? Is it uterus? Is it uh, so as muscle, right? So then I start looking for other things. Maybe it's not immune. Maybe it's other tissue in the area. Maybe it's ileocecal valve. Maybe it's the, the intestine is having an issue. What's the intestine zone like, right? Get really close to iliacus right off the, right off the ASIS and palpate in under the, the edge of the pelvis there. Is that tender? Is that what's causing that tender spot at the lung immune area, not immune problem, right? So it could, it could be something else basically. So you have to kind of Take that into into consideration as you're palpating these, but that that spot in particular is is a little bit tricky because of all those things that are there under that spot. But everywhere else, uh, like spleen in the, at the navel, it's small intestine. Like there's really nothing else there. Some muscle maybe, um, or some sometimes people will have a a bulge in there. You know, uh, it's a kind of a hernia or something. Could be something physical, not just the, the zone. So for the face, um, why are we using stomach 36? Well, stomach treats itself. Yang Ming also treats large intestine paired. Uh, whole head on the leg. Again, eye level at the knee, nose at tibial tuberosity. So stomach 36 is right there next to the nose. Classic location area for having uh, maybe some kind of uh, acne, right? Uh, or on the nose itself, right? Same level treating large intestine channel. Uh, for the same reason, stomach 44, and that would be the foot as the head, right? And so if you line up the foot with the head, you can see that eye level is basically where the toes uh, bend. So right at the crease of the knuckles is going to be eyes. So stomach 44, if they're having you know symptoms around the eyes, on stomach channel, stomach 44 is useful. Uh, but if it's more, uh, you know, down onto the face, now we're going to be 43, 42, uh, and then 41 is going to be neck. So uh, 43, 42, right? So those kind of areas. And it could be more than one needle. Um, 44 is useful as well, especially with its uh, kind of stronger heat aspect, right? Fire point, going to clear a bunch of heat. So that's a useful uh, possibility with uh, stomach 44 kind of from a TCM perspective. But otherwise, 43, 42, I might use a little more. 36, might use also 37. You know, you can do a series of needles. Um, some call that Dalma technique. So, uh, but basically, multiple needles in an area seem to increase uh, the effectiveness of, of our treatment. Spleen 3, 4. Uh, again, face points. So, uh, head being foot. Spleen 3 and 4, going to be lining up with eye level. Uh, or just a little bit below eye level, so that's going to be right around triple warmer. So if it's if they're having sort of temple uh, acne or issues, also works for headaches, uh, neurist neurostalgias, you know anything. It's locational treatment. So anything happening right here, trauma, uh, these points treat it. In this case, acne, right? Um, uh, liver three and a half, uh, same image, right? Face and liver three and a half is basically a point that I'm finding between liver three. And, be, and liver four on the flat uh, area of this metatarsal of the big toe. Uh, there's an area that you might call liver three and a half. There's also, I think, the navicular bone there, which you could thread anywhere in there is going to work. And that's basically that small intestine point on our ch chart that we just saw. Let's see if I can scoot back really quick. So there's that little rainbow colored guy here. He's got some rouge on there. So that's zygomatic arch area, another common area for some acne, uh, but also could be a tooth issue, could be anything happening in that area. You're going to get with that liver kind of three and a half is what I'm calling it. Okay. And then uh, large intestine four, same thing. Uh, head as the hand. So now eye level is going to be basically where the the 
uh, knuckles are bending, so that means that just below I nose level is kind of going to be Li4 is right at the nose. Could be Li3, could be Lingu, kind of anywhere in there is going to be sort of that that face area. Again, large intestine treating its own channel. So now we're getting large intestine along here. We're getting the nose itself kind of anywhere around that mouth area, common for having some acne issues. Uh, large intestine 11. Again, whole head on the arm, that's eye level. So eye level there, it might be more like a large intestine 10, which we talked about earlier, not only treats uh, that immune zone, but also treats just below eye level, nose level, right? Because head, uh, eye level, nose level just below. So useful for that. Uh, heart three, lung five, more like around the eyes, right? So again, eye level, lung treats bladder opposite clock, so that's kind of in this kind of zone. Heart treats gallbladder opposite clock, so more over here, gallbladder one or forehead area, that would get with heart three as well. Let me look at a couple of questions here. What are you inclined to use for cystic acne as an, in an adult? I have an adult client who is has this, she's a vegan already. Well, um, interesting, there's probably some hormone thing. Um, polycystic ovary, I think, was mentioned earlier. Uh, there'll be a few more as we go into the nutritional pieces, uh, see if there's a couple of tweaks that might change it. Um, chocolate seems to be indicative, darn it. But um, we'll, we'll look a little bit more at that. How many of these needles would you typically use? Um, just on the zone. So uh, if they're having, um, if it's just on the nose and under here, and all we're on is large intestine and stomach channel, I my, my favorites are probably going to be, I'm going to probably try stomach 36, 37, and LI4. Uh, and then if the immune zone was reactive, LI10. Uh, and that's probably bilateral, unless it's only one-sided acne. And I probably leave it at that and see what happens. If that didn't get it, uh, I'd probably add the stomach uh, 44, 43 areas. I'd add the LI10, uh, more LI10, more maybe LI11 too, uh, another LI3. We just keep keep increasing the number of points each treatment until you start seeing symptoms. Obviously, these may not react instantly like we normally like. If there's a lot of pain and you put the needles in and the pain goes away, great, you got it, right? You you know you're in the right spot. Your needles are having an effect with the zone you're looking for. Perfect. If there's no pain, we're just going to wait to see. Uh, but a lot of these patients, it's really important on what they're doing with their food. You know, that's, that's really the big piece. Um, we're just going to assist with increased circulation in these areas. Spleen 3-4 threaded. I do them separately there, Tracy. Uh, perpendicular, and I go pretty deep. I use an inch and a half needle, and I usually, in those points, I'm probably going the full, at least an inch, probably in the inch and a half, almost 40 millimeters. Um, good questions, guys. Annie, are you using torso clock opposite and head clock opposite together? Yes. All the images are there. All the relationships are there all the time. You can take advantage of any of them that you want um, at the same time. For acne, at the jawline, would you use same side stomach channel? Yes. Um, or opposite pericardium? Probably both, Bianca. Yes, probably both. Um, I would probably start with the stomach points uh, just because it's also going to get large intestine being that young Ming, but pericardium would be another add if it's not uh, getting it um, like I would like. Hives. Same diff. Yep, I would I would treat hives the same way. When we cover eczema, I would probably call it, uh, it would be under the eczema, I think. Um, cause more complicated. Yeah, probably allergies. Uh, Hana, generalized hives, uh, channels, torso, and limbs. Yeah, so we're going to work on channels. If it's totally systemic, that is a full body approach. Probably the best way to really figure it out is do a fast and then have them reincorporate the most common allergic foods um, first and see what happens when they eat one of those foods as long as it calmed down. Now, they may have to fast or do a semi-fast for many days in order to get that that immune system to calm down and see skin clearing depending on how long that's been so it may be a little beyond us in our clinical practices and, and they need to go to a, a fasting clinic um, if it's if it's a really bad case and they're they're willing to do such a thing true north health center would be would be my choice um, that's the that's the best i know anyway um, though uh, donna said that she has a friend who's um maybe has has his own fasting clinic that's smaller that would be interesting I'd be curious to, I want to talk to you more about that later, Donna. Thanks. Generally, as hives, uh, yin yang channel is good. Shouldn't dermatologists be needled more shallowly? Also, great uh, point, Luis. Yes, I do like to needle sh at skin level. So I like to needle the level. So bone for bone, muscle, 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 tendon, tendon, skin, skin. So these points typically threaded under the skin superficially, but not necessarily um, just uh, only under the surface. 
meaning that you wouldn't just, I mean, if you wanted to use a whole bunch of needles, you could just tap them in, tap, tap, tap. You might put five or six needles between stomach 36 and 37 if you're just tapping them. Otherwise, you could tap in stomach 36 and then get it really transverse and just kind of thread it under the skin towards 37. Um, the spleen 3, 4, not so easy to do that way, but you could try it that way as well. So good, good point on that, yeah. Thinking about the skin, usually the way I needle spleen 3, 4 is deep, but in this case, you're right. You might, and that might be a thread. I, I see where you were going with that question. Or four to three, yeah, that would probably be easier than three to four, yeah, because the the big toe is kind of getting in the way, trying to get uh, four and three into four. So four to three would be would be an easier way to go. Okay, if it's on the back, just like we're treating back pain, I, if those of you who have uh, seen some of my stuff before, you'll recognize spleen five and a half, liver five, heart four, and lung seven. The basic set for upper back pain of any kind of uh, muscle going on. So also useful for acne. Um, and again, they might be a little more shallowy, shallower needled and uh, kind of area affected to, to get more of a skin reaction. Yep. Excellent questions, guys. Thanks for asking. Uh, herbal wise, Dermatrol is uh, Evergreen's formula. I've used this and seen some good results. Dermatrol, uh, PS, if there's lots of pus involved. And uh, so for those really uh, type pussy type patients or the ones who are having more of infection than that Dermatrol PS. And then, of course, if infection is happening, the Herbal ABX, I really like that formula. Um, and then uh, Marguerite Acne Pills has shown to be really excellent, though there may be some toxicity issues with uh, the brands coming out of China. So we have to be careful with Marguerite Acne. I'd probably get it from a trusted source uh, if you're going to use it. But I do like that there are pearls in it. Grind up pearls, mash them up, and then put them in there. And uh, I have seen some really good... Um, reactions with the acne pills. Okay. So more common in countries with Western diets. Here's our nutritional lifestyle section. Uh, majority of teens of 40 to 50% of adults have it, uh, which is a lot more than I thought, especially in the adult world. Um, basically, avoiding chocolate, fried, and fatty foods doesn't seem to be proven effective, though it seems logical. Uh, indigenous whole food plant-based uh, diet eaters around the world, say Amazon or various parts of Africa, um, basically are not eating saturated fats. Uh, they are largely acne-free as a culture. Um, excess fat or and calories uh, are possibly to cause here. So saturated fat specifically is um, increases the IGF-1 and, and androgens. So the fat hormone connection seems to be a big deal. So those eating the least amount of saturated fat in these plant-based um, communities uh, seem to be better off. So meat and milk are the two highest sources of saturated fats, though you can find some in the palm oils uh, like uh, or the tropical oils like palm oil, coconut oil, that kind of thing. Some significant saturated fat there. Uh, dairy seems to increase prevalence by 40%. Up to 85% of teens, it's a big percentage, and basically the, they're blaming it on the meat sweet diet that we have here, and as we spread it around the world to everybody else, because our brains just crave it, chemically speaking. Um, dairy is bad. Barberries seem to be very effective. And uh, for more information on that, go see uh, nutritionfacts.org, Topics Under Acne. Barberries, really nutritious uh, berries, by the way. One, they're, they're one of those berries that's like off the chart with um, antioxidants. Um, basically, a teaspoon three times a day for a month gave a 40% drop in acne breakouts. That was pretty huge. Tea tree oil is almost as good as using benzoyl peroxide. So uh, tea tree oil for, uh, for acne, topically speaking. Um, basically, we're trying to kill the infection. Looks like tea tree oil has an effect. Cocoa powder and chocolate. Basically, they were trying to differentiate out with a whole number of studies whether it was the milk in the chocolate, milk chocolate, that was causing more acne breakouts. And they found when they gave people cocoa powder um, in capsules, uh, double blind placebo controlled, uh, they found that double the acne lesion. So there is something actually in the cocoa powder. Darn it. Not just uh, so dark chocolate doesn't save the day as far as our poor acne teens. Um, milk and dairy, a uh, major cause of acne and other diseases, so try to avoid that stuff. Green tea has a great effect on being antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial, all kinds of good effects of green tea lotion. Um, cutting lesions by 50%, just with a 2% lotion, you can make it your own with matcha uh, a little and a little coconut oil or some kind of a lotion-y substance that you might want to use. 
you can do foot baths with it. Uh, it helps impedigo. Um, again, mouthwash, uh, UTIs is it's useful. A cup every eight hours seems to cut it down. Uh, it's and it's a prebiotic. It doesn't hurt other good bacteria. You might worry. Oh no, what about my good bacteria? Is it just killing everything? Nope, it's a prebiotic. It actually benefits the good stuff. So uh, can't go wrong with green tea. Okay, done with that version of dermatology. Ready for psoriasis, everybody? Or any questions on? Um, probably the cockroach dander. <laughs> you remember that too, don't you, Colin? Yep. Might just be the cockroaches. Or maybe the uh, the uh, the mouse hairs, right? Could be the mouse hairs, mouse hairs and cockroach dander. Oh, great! Radio, on we go. Psoriasis, um, inflammation, and hyperproliferation of the epidermis looks like what's going on with psoriasis. Five million Americans get it. Um, genetic. Seems to play a role, but not all everybody. Has autoimmune features, though we don't know what the triggers are. 80% uh, of people are getting plaque psoriasis. Elbows and knees are the most common areas. Uh, seems like sunlight seems to help. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, 10 to 25% are psoriatic arthritis. So then you start getting arthritic symptoms as it uh, you know starts affecting the joints. Thick skin plaques and silvery scales are the classic symptoms. You also get some nail changes, deformations and pitting in the nails, thickening, discoloration, that kind of thing. Um, basically relapsing with meds, trauma, stress, alcohol, and tobacco. So, um, Laura, I don't know if there's a mold connection with psoriasis. Um, I would think it's possible. Um, seems to me like there's um, <laughs> it's food uh, that it, it, there's an allergy uh, to something in someone's diet that may be not causing it but making it a lot worse. So if they're able to remove that substance, I think uh, any kind of skin condition seems to get better uh, unless it's just an exposure to something nasty. I've had a, a couple of patients that were worked in factories and way back when didn't use gloves and lots of stuff penetrated their hands and they've had terrible skin issues on their hands ever since. Just constant peeling as the skin's probably trying to get the toxins out that are just penetrated through nasty chemicals. So I don't think diet has a heck of a lot to do with that one. But um, it wouldn't hurt to have more antioxidants to give your body options to uh, kind of detoxify, if you will. Um, so genetics seem to be a risk factor. Uh, meds and steroids, uh, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors even, NSAIDs, I was surprised at that, seem to be risk factors for having more incidents. So medication-induced um, there's some iatrogenic disease for you. Uh, infections, of course, stress, obesity, and uh, moderate sunlight seems to help. Of course, uh, they're doing derm exams, uh, appearance and location. They're also trying to rule out other types of arthritis if they're finding psoriatic arthritis. Many possible pulses uh, on these kinds of patients, uh, but if they're actively having a lot of indications, then uh, that, that lung large intestine pulse might be a little bit more for its skin react relationship, but uh, not necessarily. So um, I usually don't find much pulse relation with this one. Uh, also with uh, the abdominal palpation, not so much. Uh, medication related, uh, usually they're giving all kinds of topical stuff, steroids, moisturizer, synthetic vitamin D seems to have some effects. Uh, coal tar, I've had use for all kinds of things. Uh, even they make some shampoos with coal tar, seems useful for people who are having that uh, version of uh, seborrheic uh, stuff on their scalp, which is kind of similar to psoriasis. Seems to have an effect, uh, doesn't have to be used every day. But um, I worry about the toxicity in the tar, I don't know if we know how toxic that is. Phytotherapy, of course, is the sunlight therapy. Systemic therapy, uh, methotrexate gets used on some of these patients, and that stuff's really nasty. Um, stress reduction, stress seems to make it worse. So, uh, However, people best deal with their stress. Meditation, I like reading Tao Te Ching, seems to uh, put me in perspective <laughs> as the spec in a universe, um, makes the problems that seem big not so big. Uh, channels and images vary, but uh, if we're looking elbows and knees, which is really the most common, um, then you might use whichever's worse. So if elbows are really bad, might use knees to treat elbows. If uh, knees are really bad, maybe use elbows to treat knees, right? So uh, you might just pick one. If they're both equally bad, I'd probably uh, alternate. So 
uh, needle the knees to treat the elbows one treatment and then alternate. So do the uh, knees to treat the elbows the next treatment. So that might be a way to go. And again, we're kind of threading right under the skin there. So it might be multiple needles kind of, kind of underneath the skin uh, around that kneecap area to treat, you know, sort of this area. If it's on different channels, uh, we're lucky, right? So if it's knees uh, at, you know, stomach spleen, then lung large intestine is typically not where they're getting it. They're getting it on elbow small intestine. So then we can needle bladder to treat small intestine. We can needle lung large intestine to treat stomach spleen. Perfect. But uh, if they are on the same channels, we're a little bit out of luck. Okay. Herbal treatment wise, we've got uh, Dermatrol and we've got uh, PS again and we've got uh, the Gardenia Complex for the really heat toxic ones. It'll just be clearing, clearing, clearing. And we may take a break after this section, guys. Um, lifestyle nutrition. So they're uh, basically we're trying to limit uh, inflammation factors, limit calories, seems to help people who are on a low calorie diet. Uh, I may be wrong on my pus version, Mayo. Maybe it is psoriasis. Would someone else chime in? I think you're probably right. I may grab a book here in a minute and look it up. Uh, fasting, low-calorie diets, vegetarian diets seem to be assisting these patients. Weight loss seems to help. That could just be when they're cutting out junk, and the junk was making it worse. Okay, thanks. I was wrong. I'll, I'll have to correct my slide for later. Let me make a note. Dermatrol. I don't know where I got the pus thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lowering the leukotrienes, which is these inflammatory compounds. Um, I think we had it. Uh, Omega-6s were increasing those earlier, but I might be wrong on that. Um, anything that reduces the IGF-1, uh, animal proteins seem to increase that. Gluten-free diets seem to help these patients. So there's this allergic reaction thing, maybe not a cause, but making it worse, right? Uh, more Research seems to be needed on the omega-3 correlations, whether they help or not, and avoiding alcohol seems to be beneficial for these patients. Aloe vera looks fantastic uh, against placebo as far as curing it, but the placebo got an 80% cure. So incredibly placebo sensitive uh, when treating psoriasis. So basically, um, if you tell your patients you got some magic cream, it's probably going to work. <laughs> <laughs> on a psoriasis patient, since placebo is so huge. So, um, so yeah, topically, yes, you know. And inflammatory species uh, by weight. So uh, spices are amazingly anti-inflammatory. They are loaded with phytonutrients, and by weight, they are the highest concentration. Uh, so cloves, ginger, rosemary, turmeric, you know, load up on spices uh, on, uh, on anything you're eating. Um, I, th I throw basically pumpkin pie spice in anything I bake, uh, lots of it, tablespoons of it in, in pancakes, whatever, just to try to increase that content. Uh, yeah. Garlic also another strong phytonutrient, uh, type of stuff. Potassium has some interesting effects, uh, decreases the inflammation, stimulates adrenals. Interesting. I didn't know that about potassium stimulating adrenals to boost corticosteroid levels. I wonder if that has long-term consequences like steroids do. Um, I don't know if anybody knows. Chime in. I, I haven't looked that up yet. I didn't have time. But I'm going to now make a note to remind myself to look it up. One of many. Potassium corticosteroid use. Awesome. Uh, where's the best source? Oh, this is funny, you guys. Where's the best source of potassium? Anybody? Does anybody know? Everybody seems to know. One thing about nutrition, they know that potassium comes from bananas, right? Actually, it's crazy. Bananas are really low. Yes, dates are very high. Um, uh, where does it come from? Canned tomatoes are off the chart in potassium. Uh, and uh, orange juice is really big. Greens, beans, and dates are really high. But bananas are not. They're like... Number 100, here's a, here's a chart uh, that came out of one of Dr. Greger's videos, and uh, bananas come in at number 86 right after vanilla milkshakes. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I thought that was hilarious. I've always thought bananas, but no, eat some dates. How about that? <laughs> I know, right? Who knew? They're still good for us. Bananas are great, but not necessarily very high in potassium. It's a big 
big, huge misnomer. Here I go, slashing people's, yep. Why canned? Anjali, I don't know why the canned tomatoes. Um, maybe it's more concentrated. It might have been tova tomato paste. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Dates we found were exceptionally effective in the last uh, month of pregnancy. Really, it ripens the cervix. It, it helps in dilation. Lots of, of women, they, it's like six dates a day uh, for the last month. Totally improves uh, birth rates in, in women. It's amazing. Just, you know, prevents all kinds of problems. So, uh, remember dates, very useful stuff. Good ways to sweeten things too. I bake with a lot of dates. Throw it in the blender with uh, plant-based milk and then use that to uh, sweeten things as a liquid, whether it's uh, baking cakes or pies or whatever. Very useful. I like dates a lot. I'm trying to grow them. We'll see if I can do it indoors. I don't think I'll be able to, but pray for me. <laughs> I'm trying to grow some dates inside. That'll be fun, wouldn't it? Okay, eczema's next. Let's take a quick break, 10.20. Um, and then maybe uh, five, ten minutes. Do you have a, something you need to do, Donna, uh, to talk about? <clears throat> and then we can take ten, or do you need uh, – or it's five, okay. Okay, great. Um, let's do a quick five, guys. Um, and uh, so ten, twenty-five, or twenty-six, I suppose, something like that. Okay. Awesome. See y'all back in a couple of minutes. If anyone's still there, I uploaded the lecture notes. And Karen asks, are we supposed to take a quiz yesterday? Yes, you are supposed to take a quiz if you paid or are a Gold Pass member and you would like CEUs. And it's already in your account, so please do check that. Let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you.
All right. Is everybody back? <clears throat> Great. <clears throat> Eczema is next. <clears throat> For some reason I got a little frog in my throat. <clears throat> By the way, if any of you um, need to uh, talk a lot and or you have, um, say, singing patients, this stuff, Lohan Guo, as a tea, is pretty amazing. Um, they put a lot of sugar in it, which I'm not really happy about, but um, it's so sweet. It's monk fruit, you know, our hot fruit, um, but it's really delicious, sweet, and it soothes your throat. It's excellent for um, speaking. Uh, if I if I had to talk for three days straight or something, um, if I didn't have this, I'd, I'm sure I'd lose my voice. <clears throat> it's really good. The other one I really like, which helps me a ton, which I talked about yesterday, is Bonlan Gun Tea, which has... <clears throat> Radix Isatis and Folium Isatis. So not only is it Bunlan Gun, but it's um, Ching Ching Dai Folium Isatis Perilla Leaf. Some of you will know. Anyway, I like them both. They're great. That one's really good for sore throats, early infections. It's antiviral. Uh, very useful for um, <clears throat> like a strep, chronic strep. People are getting strep over and over again. Start drinking that every day and uh, it eases off. Okay, eczema. <clears throat> uh, oh, the first tea, Svetlana, is is uh, Lohan Guo uh, was the first one. They come in these little cubes. You can also get them in packages. Lohan uh, tea. Lohan beverage. Comes in a little in a little box of a whole bunch of these little packages. Um, and there's two little cubes kind of put together in one packet. So you just take one cube, drop it in hot water, stir it up. <clears throat> Sweet, delicious, good for the throat. Okay. So 20% of people worldwide have eczema of some kind. Uh, currently... Concurrent with asthma is classic, food allergies, respiratory allergies. So basically, it's an allergic reaction you're having, and, and it's just coming out on the skin. Uh, usually resolves in a few months, maybe six months. Uh, itching, red patches, scaling, thick skin. Increased risk for skin infections, though. So you might get cracking and then an infection. Um, it does have sugar and sorry. Uh, there, but you can make your own without sugar. Just get the bulk Lohan Guo or maybe the granulated Lohan Guo. Um, risk factors. Did I finish that slide? Yes, I did. <clears throat> risk factors, uh, basically family history or a history of allergies, some kind of toxin exposure. Like I was saying, I had that patient who uh, their hands were exposed to, to lots of toxic chemicals in a workplace. And so he was having constant eczema on the hands, uh, trying to like, you know, get rid of that toxin. Um, uh, especially in developed countries, they really don't have a lot of the safety um, precautions that we do as far as, um, you know, e exposures of chemicals or safety around workplaces. Uh, and so they have a lot more of this kind of exposure. Um, early breastfeeding seems to reduce the risk. Basically, they're, uh, diagnostically, medical professionals are looking for uh, history. They do a dermatological exam, of course. 80% um, of the patients seem to have elevated IgE and positive skin allergen tests, though when we talked about food allergies yesterday, uh, we mentioned that uh, those tests aren't very accurate. Um, so even if somebody doesn't show skin prick test allergy to, to a substance, it doesn't mean they don't have the allergy. They might still have it. It just didn't show up on the skin. And if it does show up on the skin, it really also doesn't mean that you're allergic to the thing that it is. So they're not that accurate. Um, they're really the best way to know is to fast, uh, clear out the immunoglobulins, takes about five days of not eating 
any of the substances that you have an allergic reaction to or that are related to those, uh, and then slowly bring back one food at a time in significant quantity so that your immune system can react to it and you can get a big uh, symptom that you will recognize as a, a problem. One of the ways of testing was uh, testing your heart rate. So checking your heart rate after eating a food that you might be allergic to, uh, 50 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour after, and seeing what happens to your heart rate you know, before and after you ate said substance. Could be lots of different possible pulses. Again, uh, since it's a skin that we're looking at, uh, the large intestine lung uh, connection possible uh, with skin. So that pulse might show something, but again, uh, not as likely uh, as other type syndromes. And um, also the uh, abdominal might not show much, or you might get it in the lung or immune area possibly. Uh, usually topical meds or steroids are used in the bad cases. <clears throat> stress seems to make it worse, so stress reduction seems to help these patients in dealing with it. Antihistamines, of course, are very common. Antibiotics for the people who are getting infections, of course. And then uh, light even seems to help the eczema cases. Um, and then there's systemic therapies if people are really bad. So, like again, the methotrexate stuff. Um, yeah, channels and images vary. Uh, most common areas, of, again, we're just going to image the zones as if, treat as if it's pain. So if it's, uh, again, uh, say on the lower leg eczema, then we're going to mirror the lower arm. We're going to match our channels up if it's extremities, name pairs, and we're going to look for those areas. And then we're just going to kind of thread needles along. And you might do a bunch of needles in, in an area, like if there's a whole area that's involved, you go find its related spot find the area that's going to, you know, kind of demarcate it for yourself and then just kind of needle and thread around with a whole bunch of points. And, uh, and that seems to have the most effect on increasing the circulation to that skin area that's affected. Uh, but then trying to figure out what is allergically, uh, you know, the patient's responding to uh, is very important. So uh, that can be tricky. Uh, there are really, there's some major major allergy foods that are really common, eggs, milk, that kind of stuff. Uh, but sometimes it's something odd like, you know, strawberries. Um, great. <clears throat> Needle skin level. Fingers and toes. Um, is Jennifer, is one of them worse? Is it worse on the fingers or worse on the toes? If so, needle the opposite. If, uh, if they aren't worse on one or the other, for example, uh, then I might figure out which one came first. So maybe it started on the fingers and then spread to the toes. So if it was on the fingers first, then that is the original disease. We treat the opposite of that. And uh, that may be why the toes are reacting to the fingers because um, they are already a correlate, right? So oftentimes we'll find that with pain also. If somebody has shoulder pain and um, they have hip pain on the opposite side, exactly the same channel, then we go, well, what do you do? Because, you you know, if it's small intestine uh, 9, 10 area pain and they've also got pain on gallbladder bladder channel in the hip area, well, do you needle the, the hip to treat the shoulder? Well, we can reverse it, right? Uh, that's one option. Uh, or we could say, well, which one came first? The hip is just, is just, uh, you know, causing its, 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 it's basically treating the shoulder automatically. So the correlation, the body's already doing it. It's already doing that connection. Uh, we're just going to help it along. So then we might needle the hip, even though there's pain where we're needling because it treats the shoulder as long as it doesn't make the hip worse. If the hip starts getting worse with the needling, then uh, nix that idea, go to the, go to reverse it down to the ankle and get it that way. So same kind of idea. <clears throat> uh, Again, you could reverse it. So uh, again, we said that that you know the wrist and ankle relate. So so the the wrist is going to uh, mirror onto the the hip joint. Hand is going to come up onto the pelvis. So you could needle around the pelvic area or needle around the shoulder area to treat fingers and toes. Also, uh, if you can match the channels up enough, which might be a little bit tricky. So um, might take a whole bunch of needles because um, small area on the hand, large area on the shoulder, so it's going to spread out. You're going to need bigger areas. Personal eczema inconsistently irritated by hand washing and is hard to get under control. Strangely, it's just ring finger and pinky. So yeah, opposite foot. 
Uh, and then I would start with needling sort of the ba fung kind of points between the toes, kind of at the knuckle level, uh, between the third and fourth toe, between the fourth and fifth toe, and at the edge on the side of the uh, fifth toe. <clears throat> um, I've seen them resolve. Uh, I think the acupuncture assists. Usually there's something that's um, irritated that area that, that uh, you need to stop doing, but it's, it's hard to know. It gets complicated with, um, you know, soaps you're using and, and, you know, switch brands and all that kind of stuff. So, yep. Good questions on Jolly. Um, herbal treatment wise, Siler X. Excellent. That's kind of your classic wind you know, Xiao Feng San kind of formula, uh, Dermatrol Dry, Dermatrol Damp, um, Herbal uh, Detox uh, for the de detoxy type of patients. Um, and then if babies are having it, right, really common like cradle cap kind of situation, um, you can give mom the formula, travels right through the breast milk and gets into baby. We've done that a number of times. Um, we want to be careful if there's anything that's potentially toxic in the formula. We're not sure what's going to make it through the breast milk into baby. Uh, so we want to be um, cautious in that case. Uh, topicals, there are a number of them. Um, I don't know if Evergreen has topicals, not that I know of. You can make some. Uh, here's a poison oak soak. I like this one a lot, so I threw it up here for you guys. Um, but there's a number of brands of topicals out there. I think uh, Blue Poppy's got some that I've seen some success with. Uh, but there's, but just your classic, the classic burn cream is great. What's that? Ching Wan Hung. Do you guys know that one? Let me type that in so you have the name. I love this stuff. I've seen it treat infections. Ching Wan Hung. Uh, it's sesame oil based. Good stuff. So I would try that probably first. Um, I have mom put breast milk on everything. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, good stuff, right? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Herbal treatment for poison oak. So this is basically a uh, bulk herb tea that you then boil up and dump the whole pot into the bath water and then soak in it. And I've had patients just absolutely clear up their poison oak with this stuff. Fantastic. You may only have to do it a couple of times and you're done. So very useful. Ooh, diaper rash. I haven't tried it for that. Vitiligo. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, Tamara, uh, vitiligo is tricky because uh, it, it's the melanin in the skin um, that is uh, kind of going away. Usually it kind of starts at a scar area and then continues spreading. So um, I've seen various kinds of topical herbs. I had a few of vitiligo patients way back in the day and I used, it, it can be, sometimes it's genetic, but um, oftentimes, even though you're predisposed genetically, you won't necessarily get it until you get a scar. Uh, usually it's a darker skinned person. And then as, as the scar heals, you get that light spot and then that starts spreading. Um, those are the cases that I've seen. And um, it was, it was hard. We had some, there were a couple of topical herbs listed. I, I dug through the Materia Medica's for a long time looking for topical herbs and we would keep boiling up topical herbs and washing with it and uh, it didn't seem to change it so it didn't it hasn't worked for me I, I don't have a treatment for it I'm sorry melasmas um, yeah I wouldn't I don't have anything specific for those either Gene um, but um, you could try again those topical herbs you could try the the Ching Wan Hung I mean it's it's kind of experimental um, we sort of have to just see what, what's going to work for that particular patient. I had a rosacea patient uh, that we were working on, and we were putting topical herbs on as well. Also didn't get very far with that one. So um, topical herbs haven't really worked that great for me as far as skin stuff goes, other than uh, some of these creams and pastes that are, are pre-made uh, that you can put on for infections and things. Yeah. Great. Uh, breastfeeding seems to... Um, if they avoid, if mom is avoiding uh, exposure to cow's milk proteins, then she has less allergic breast milk, which then doesn't cause allergies in babies. That's pretty common. Um, avoiding allergy to foods like eggs, uh, dairy, soy, wheat are the big ones. Corn, you could throw in there too. Um, delayed introduction to foods for four to six months uh, as far as babies go. And uh, there's a whole series of foods that can be introduced at certain times. There's a Dr. Furman 
who has a book about that. We talked a little bit about it yesterday, F-U-H-R-M-A-N. He's got a book about um, childhood um, health, and, uh, and he has a very clear, like, when you can add what food uh, to your baby's diets. So that's good. The peanuts come way late, fish late, that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see, adults, birch pollen f allergies uh, and foods can be an issue. So uh, apples, carrots, celery, and hazelnuts. Interestingly enough, I myself have a slight birch pollen allergy, which I got, this is a note for everybody, uh, I have my own iatrogenic disease. <laughs> I was having lots of allergies working at the Ocom Herbal Dispensary as a supervisor for four or five years, and I made a ton of formal, I was just around the dust of the dispensary for many hours a day for years and I developed and uh, started developing allergies just to the dust of the herbs in general so I tried taking herbs to tonify my immune system so I was taking lots of Huang Chi of course astragalus right so I took Huang Chi and developed an allergy to it because I took it in an extract form in a granule form I took a, a little liquid concoction of it I boiled it up as a tea I took it every form I could get it uh, to try to boost the immune system enough to fight off this thing and I developed an allergy to Huang Chi, and it's related to this birch pollen. So now I'm allergic to also to ginseng, uh, raw carrots and celery, though if they're slightly cooked, no problem. I don't seem to have a problem with apples or hazelnuts. So mine's kind of a weird one, uh, and it seems to have lessened over the years. So now that I'm 10 to 15 years away from doing that, uh, it's it's lessened. Uh, but it's it's taken time. All right, on we go. Uh, vegetarian or low energy diets, 50% of energy needs. So if you put people on like a, a really low uh, energy type diet, then um, they tend to get better. The eczema seems to clear. It's almost like fasting. It's like the body goes into like self-eating mode, right? Because you're not getting enough calories. So the body sort of starts eating itself, autophagy, I believe that's called in the in the cancer world when the body starts eating away the cancers. So not only will it eat in that state, it'll eat, it actually has longevity properties. You can look up like uh, the uh, the longevity low calorie eaters uh, and they, they live longer lives. They have to wear like weight vests to keep their bones healthy and strong. It's, it's uh, kind of a crazy lifestyle. Uh, but it seems effective for treating skin conditions as well, and probably because the body's running around looking for things to eat up because it needs some energy, and so it gobbles up things like tumors and fat deposits and skin issues. It'll it'll gobble up little bits of skin that it's left lying around that aren't vitally important. So um, that's a actually a technique that can work. Probiotics seem useful, so pre and postnatal probiotics for uh, moms and babies seem to prevent 50%. So that makes you think that there's some kind of a, a bacterial relationship where the immune system isn't as strong as it could be with our good gut bacteria. So giving these patients probiotics is probably a really good idea. Um, stevia, amazingly, I didn't know this. I had to throw this in there. 64% of affected infants showed an allergy to stevia. That was interesting. So those uh, stevia sweetened formulas... Um, look out for those. Eggs, meat, and milk seem to be uh, big uh, eczema producers. Eggs, two-thirds of uh, are related to ocomucoid um, proteins. Uh, packaged foods have a lot of this stuff in it, and sometimes they don't even have to report that it's in there, so you may not know it's in there. Uh, goat milk seems to have cross-reactions, so that really doesn't help you out as far as getting away from cow dairy, but uh, ass and horse milk seem to be a completely different category and fine with. So go find yourself some ass and horse milk and you'll be okay as far as allergies go. I thought that was funny. Sorry. <laughs> horse milk. Come across that pretty often, don't we? Okay, exclusion diets can get kind of crazy, but sometimes these work really good, but sometimes they're just nuts. So the best ones seem to be w the ones that are more fruits and vegetables, avoiding eggs and milk, basically. Uh, but some of them are crazy kinds of diets, trying to, trying to you know, don't eat this, don't eat that, but eat a whole bunch of this other crazy food. Um, ingested oils don't seem to help, like evening primrose or borage oil, hemp seed oil, those don't seem to be doing much. Licorice root in a gel seems effective. So a gel paste made from licorice root extract, 
Gonsau, right? St. John's wort cream was very useful, but they didn't have a control group in the study, so we don't really know if it was just placebo reaction, which we know that placebo has a huge effect on other skin issues, like with the uh, with a study on the aloe. Uh, and oolong tea, four cups a day, had a really strong result, but again, no control group, so we don't know. Topical oils seem okay. Uh, coconut oil seems to be better than mineral or olive oil, probably because of its um, you know, more thick consistency and, oil re and water retention quality. Uh, but petroleum joy jelly, interestingly enough, seems to be the best. It uh, helps the genes. It's very interesting. They did all these studies on petroleum jelly. It helps the genes fight infection. It reduces inflammation. And it helps the skin barrier function protection better. I would have thought, boy, that stuff must be toxic. It comes from oil. It has all these great benefits. And actually, if you've ever gotten a tattoo, they're basically slathering you in petroleum jelly and then driving their you know, needle and ink through it. And it just helps it heal so much faster. Keeps it clear. Ask any tattooed artist. They love their petroleum jelly. Um, Luis, interesting question. Let's see. Have you tried bloodletting for dermatological conditions? I have not tried the bloodletting. Um, well, I, I take that back. You know, I have done a few. Um, in fact, I think what I did was in, in one really retracting case, um, I think I uh, did little blood, almost like a seven star needle. And then cupped it, so it was like a wet cupping, and then tried to suck out whatever toxin was right in the area. But I think I, I really think these things are systemic, and there's some allergic component, um, and just pulling some blood out of the area may not be effective for those kinds. If it's something where someone was exposed to some toxins in an area, that might be more effective. So especially those people who have eczema, like on their skin, you might bleed the ting points, jing wells, that kind of thing, and try to get the toxin out, say maybe there, get new blood in. That might make a difference. Um, okay, so for some reason, Durham was at the end. Um, so we're going to go back, back, back. Even though it looks like we're over, we're not over. Going, let's do psychology. So let's do psychological next. Um, abalone is a base for our custom cream topicals. Also does not penetrate like petroleum. Interesting. Oh. Interesting. So, Gene, I've heard of the Vicks Vapor Rub. Maybe it's working because of the petroleum jelly piece, but I haven't tried just petroleum jelly only without the Vicks part in it. That's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Ta-da! Excellent, Donna. You guys are all over this. I love it. Hair loss, also a good question. Yeah, that's tricky. You know, alopecia. So, um, yeah, I don't have a trick. Um I, I try the herbs. I um, I did have a patient who came in with it, and they said that when they'd had it previously, they went to a different acupuncturist in New York, and they had done seven-star needle on their head uh, to get increased blood flow in the area of uh, of the alopecia, and that had worked for them. It had grown back. And I thought, wow, awesome. Let's do it. So we did it. We tenderized the scalp. Um, I haven't seen her since. I don't know what happened. I should probably call and find out. But people who have hair loss, unless they're really deficient, uh, the ton tonics for me don't seem to really do it. Um, but I have had a few that were just really weak and deficient. And so, um, yeah, the Husho Wu kind of situation. Uh, but, you know, just your basic blood tonics for the hair. Um, I've seen it help hair, but um, not on all the cases. Some of them, it's kind of an unknown hair loss situation. Nice. Okay, psychological. On we go. So we're going to go to for another hour or so. And, um, oh, Polygon down 14. Nice. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, psychological. We're going to cover uh, ADHD, depression, anxiety and stress, and insomnia. So off we go.
First and foremost, uh, ADHD. So inattentiveness, hyperactivity, poor impulse control is basically your definition of these children. Uh, five to 10% of children seem to have this these days. Genetic or an environmental question mark. Could be, is it genetic? Is it environmental? Is it a combo? I would say probably a combo. Um, though I will say that the kids who are sort of borderline, uh, that was just a boyhood energy as, as far as I was concerned, you know, when I was a child. So I think a lot of this gets blown out of proportion. Uh, wanting to like super control these kids in the classrooms. Um, but some of people, some of these kids are really totally off the wall. Uh, but so basically the symptoms are inattention, forgetfulness, uh, frequently misplacing things, inability to follow instructions. Um, but it has to be a whole bunch of these symptoms to get the diagnosis, right? Um, poor concentration, careless mistakes, <clears throat> et cetera. Then there's a hyperactivity component, kind of the fidgeting, restless, talking excessively, uh, can't really remain quiet. Uh, impulsiveness, so the the not waiting, disruptive kind of behavior, interrupting constantly, uh, and and then there's sort of this risk uh, seeking sort of activity as well. So like attempting risky kind of things. Two to three times more common in uh, male populations. 50% before the age of four, it typically shows up before the age of four, but they. I think for diagnostics, they have to be showing up before age seven. Um, 75 to 80% genetic seems to be, and uh, environmentally, there may be some early lead exposure or head injuries that lead to this as well. Maybe it kind of gets rid of that sort of filter. So you, you that, that like, oh, I better not do that because they might not like it. Uh, they just blow right through that filter. So that's a piece. Um, so here's the six symptoms, six symptoms from the uh, American Psychological Association for inattention uh, or, or hyperactivity <clears throat> and impulsivity. Uh, it has to be going on for six months, more than, uh, they have to be less than seven years old. Uh, it has to be happening at school and at home, both, and it has to impair uh, social, academic, or occupational functioning. So that seems like pretty high bars to me. I mean, um, it seems to me like kids were just throwing this diagnosis out all over the place, but I guess it depends on the doctor. But that seems like I've seen some kids that they say are ADHD and they didn't have all this. Um, I don't think it was impairing social. Um, academic, though, gets to be the question, right? Is it impairing academic? Well, he's not doing as good on the test as the other kids. That's academically. I guess you could kind of throw it in there, but... Um, <clears throat> a lot of these, some of these kids, they'll have uh, kind of that excessive, wiry, tight, slippery sort of general pulse. Um, if they really do have this really strong sort of a hyperactive piece. Um, and specifically, I'm looking in the hormone sort of adrenal area for that lowest sure position on the right hand side. Uh, and we're looking at uh, PC triple or channel organ and then tight, wiry, fast there as well. Uh, Medication-wise, they're typically given, which seems crazy, stimulants, uh, amphetamines, uh, for an already stimulated kid. Um, but maybe they're so stimulated by the amphetamines that it calms them down, I guess. 60 to 70% seem to be effective, which is interesting. Um, <clears throat> treating parents, too. Oh, interesting, Karen. Greatly improve the efficacy treatments for the child. That means often everyone in the family on edge multiple family members. Interesting. Thank you, Karen, for chiming in. I appreciate the experience. Uh, Non-stimulants and antidepressants are also sometimes used. And uh, behavioral interventions, meaning <clears throat> we need to behaviorally deal with these kids for school. How much TV are they watching? How much physical activity are they getting? That physical activity piece seems to be a big part. And then biofeedback seems to be useful. I have a, a patient who's a uh, doctor of psychology, and she uses biofeedback, and so she gets really good results with her ADHD kids, not on meds. Channel-wise, I'm trying to treat the brain with this. So we're looking at channels on the head. Let's have a look at the head real quick. Do we show it? We don't show it, so let's just show it here. <clears throat> looking at our faces, we've got, obviously, green being gallbladder. So we've got gallbladder channel, bladder channel, triple warmer around the temple, and GV down the middle, even though I don't show it there. But those are channels that we might be looking at as far as what's going on in the brain. 
I think brain is mostly gallbladder for me, actually. So gallbladder is kind of my focus for brain issues, uh, no matter what it is. So as we get more into this, the neurological side, um, the brain stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, channels and images. So points, uh, gallbladder 40, 41, that's going to be right at, you know, neck and head. 41 is going to be more up onto the head. That's the foot as the head, right? There's our uh, torso image. Foot as head, gallbladder 41 lining up with the head area. Gallbladder treating itself, same side. This probably needs to be, done, I mean, systemic, so bilateral um, seems to be the way to go. So gallbladder 40, 41 bilateral. Liver 3, LI4, I just love those points. Your, your basic four gates for just opening chi and blood flow. Gallbladder GV20, commonly I like that for this. Um, I might use Sushen Tsong, uh, those four needles set around the crown area. Uh, maybe even a nine needle version of Sushen Song. If you're not familiar, I can explain that. We'll talk about it more when we get to neurological stuff. Uh, heart three, lung five, again, kind of headache type points. Basically, what, what you would do for a headache um, for brain problems, right? For head problems. Uh, ear points. I love the ear points for these also. Shen men, heart liver. And I will typically put seeds on, send people home with seeds. Uh, intradermal needles would be okay as well. Oh, interesting, Kate. Great. High blood pressure med. Oh, that's interesting. Didn't know about that one. Thanks for sharing. Leave the needles in for kids. Yes, depends on the child. So um, I like to get 20 minutes with the kids with the needles. Um, but I will do in and out, uh, if the, especially the younger ones that will not uh, either sit still or relax enough. Um, or if, they, if we're just treating like an acute thing, um, injury of some kind, I might just uh, tap it, put it in, take it out, you know, and that's it. Uh, they, they respond so quickly, so easily that usually we don't have to leave things in very long. Um, nine needle efficient song when we can. Yes, Jennifer, we'll get to that. I think I actually have it listed in one of those. Okay, herbal treatment wise, Calm Junior for the juniors, uh, Calm Extra Strength and Acaris Tablets. That was always one of my favorites for these, a Seven Forest formula. Uh, good. And here's our lifestyle piece. Uh, allergic, allergic, sensitive, and deficient seem to be issues. <clears throat> oh, magnets. Interesting. Okay, Angeli. Uh, artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives seem to be uh, a big deal with uh, these kinds of cases. Uh, nutrient poor meals and snacks uh, can cause problems. Omega 3 6 ratio is uh, kind of being questioned. I don't know if we have any proof on that. Zinc, uh, how much zinc are they having or are they getting or what's their zinc level like? How are their minerals in general? Are they eating lots of sugar and aspartame? Um, basically, uh, good diet, bad diet, right? Uh, exercise seems to be as effective as medication in the studies that were shown here. Uh, increases dopamine and norepinephrine within two to five minutes. Like as soon as they run around for like just a couple of minutes, Boom, floods the brain with all kinds of dopamine and norepinephrine. I know that my kids do much better after a little running around recess. They come in, boom, they can focus again, right? Uh, so there's that, treating ADHD without stimulants. Good video to watch if you're interested. Uh, food dyes <clears throat> seem to be indicated, removed in Europe, but not in the U.S. Darn it, why is that? Thank you, Lisa, for sharing about <clears throat> Calm Junior for Kids. Uh, so, by the way, this slide, <clears throat> yeah, money, I agree. And uh, we are the best government money can buy. Uh, so, psychological, this, if you if you can zoom in on this slide really uh, quick, you guys, um, that is a food coloring called yellow number five. Look how long the ingredient of yellow number five is. That is floored me when I saw that. I thought, are you kidding? If your grandmother can't pronounce it, you probably shouldn't be eating it. All right. That is absolutely insane. These days, I look at the back of a package, which takes me forever to shop. And if it's got any coloring in it at all, I just put it back. I don't even, I don't even touch it. It's absolutely, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Not to mention the cancer causing effects, but wow, look at yellow number five. Unbelievable. Avoid that stuff like the plague. Uh, on to depression. Any more questions, you guys? I think you guys have been um, 
thoroughly sharing on there. I appreciate that. Really do like the sharing. Depression, sadness, and loss of interest or pleasure. That doesn't sound very nice. Uh, <clears throat> Evidence relating to vaccines. You know, I don't know, Luis, if we have clearness on that. So uh, I didn't have any. Um, yeah. Don't know, Luis. There could be some. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, there's a there's a number of uh, organizations out there trying to get research on that, but it seems it seems to be hard to come by. Uh, and then the research has to be questioned, and yeah, it's. Uh, doesn't look like it's being done, which also brings up questions as to why not, since we're vaccinating so many people. Uh, so good. <clears throat> so basically symptoms of depression, but we all know these, feelings of guilt, sleep disturbance, fatigue, appetite, sexual dysfunction, delusions, recurrent thoughts of death, kind of the deeper version, suicidal kind of tendency or ideation. Uh, risk factors, 15% of people seem to be having clinical depression. Uh, twice as many for women. Uh, stressful life events seem to bring on more of this. Retirement, death of a spouse, really common. Um, medical illness, of course. Suicide attempts are kind of common in this group, which is really sad. Uh, there's always some reason to be alive. Uh, so basically, they're looking for histories, uh, medication usage, and asking about suicidal ideation. <clears throat> major depressive disorder uh, to be diagnosed needs five or more of the symptoms for most of the days during a two-week period. Basically, uh, depressed most of the day, diminished pleasure for most activities, weight loss, uh, altered sleep, agitation uh, that is observable to other people, fatigue, feeling of guilt. This is how they diagnose this clinically. For us, uh, pulse-wise, it could be anything. Oftentimes, liver will show up with uh, depression or anxiety. And so uh, liver areas of pulse, <clears throat> we're looking at the organ, maybe also the channel, but tight wiriness typically. Sometimes it'll be weak and deficient as well. Silver. <clears throat> As far as the abdominal palpation goes, we're looking, again, liver zones, if any. Sometimes you're not going to find many, but uh, typically there's some pent-up something going on. And so uh, liver zone, liver crossing zone, tight tender, those are released with liver four, same side as the zone. <clears throat> and then allopathic medication, with, uh, lots of medications. They're considered to be 50% effective. Uh, talk therapy would be my preference. And... Um, Exercise seems to be as good as the meds also, which is great to know. So get out there and start moving. Um, and then smoking cessation seems beneficial. Channels that we might look at, again, brain kind of channels and then those, those abdominal zones. So abdominal zones, that liver force, spleen, five point listed over there under points. Uh, gallbladder 3440, we said that earlier. Liver 35 also mentioned. Um, head area. And uh, again, focusing on liver area, liver zones, liver areas, uh, spleen six, liver four, uh, LI four. We're working on upper back with the spleen six and the liver five, uh, and uh, GV twenty and Yin Tong. I really like for these kinds of patients as well. Uh, Shen Man heart, liver. A lot of these things are pretty classic. Um, I think my addition would be maybe some of the kind of headache type points. So there might be lung five, there might be heart three. Uh, heart 7 going to get the vertex part. Lung 9 would get vertex part. Uh, 7 also because of its uh, Shen relaxing characteristics. Um, uh, those are kind of the ideas there. Um, everything else is pretty self-explanatory. A couple of great uh, formulas here. Shine is a wonderful used formula here from Evergreen. And there's a Shine DS which is safe with medications, whereas regular shine has St. John's wort. So I want to be careful on the interactions, right? St. John's wort has that um, uh, contraindication as a, with the MAO inhibitors. So you might have some problems with getting a serotonin reaction, uh, which can lead to death. So at least lethargy and could be death. So we want to be careful with St. John's wort on these patients if they're taking meds already. Uh, but you could get the DS shine formula and be safe. Caffeine and alcohol are um, things that seem to exacerbate <clears throat> or make worse, especially the alcohol being a depressant, the caffeine being overstimulating. 
Weight loss, uh, if the patient's obese. Diabetes seems to be associated with depression. B vitamins might be uh, low with these patients. Uh, Omega-3 is still a question mark, uh, a little unclear as to whether that's beneficial or not. In the studies, uh, St. John's wort, 50% to 70% effective, which is huge. Good reason to put it in a formula for mild depression, not the severe stuff. Um, And then, but you have to watch out for those SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, SAMe has similar effects to SSRIs as well. So SAMe is another one that you could look at. Yes, Elaine. So, right. Uh, Hu Huan P and Hu Huan Hua is nice for these types of patients. Yeah, very useful. Happy, happy flowers. Hu Huan Hua, that's what we used to call them. <clears throat> plant-based diet. Uh, people eating plant-based diets seem to feel better and have more vigor. Uh, naturally, the foods naturally inhibit uh, MAOs and uh, arachidonic acid leads to some brain inflammation. So animal foods may are probably why uh, if you avoid them, people are feeling better. So chicken and eggs seem to be the worst with that arachidonic acid. <clears throat> and those are under the nutrition facts topics of, of depression. It does seem to be genetic. Uh, the question is why uh, there is maybe a defense against infection, uh, like a depression. So like when you're sick, uh, you have a surge of inflammation. Uh, being infected is kind of like being depressed. You're sleepy, you're tired. You don't really want to socially contact people. You just really want to, you know, kind of lay low. So um, it could be that depression is exactly like being ill in that it's an inflammatory response. So um, in so depression diagnosed as an inflammation response is an interesting idea. And that may be why when you reduce inflammation markers like C-reactive protein uh, or interferon, <clears throat> or when someone takes interferon, which raises that, that inflammation marker, you get major depression from it. And vaccines, you get some some more depression after a vaccine when it's raising that inflammation level. Uh, and maybe why a plant-based diet is beneficial because it's reducing the inflammation in general uh, if you're uh, eating it correctly. That's why anti-inflammatory diets increase uh, decrease depression rates. Plant-based diets are the most anti-inflammatory uh, as known. C-reactive protein goes down 30% in two weeks on a whole food plant-based diet. Oxidative stress uh, seems to be something also that changes on a plant-based diet. And so free radicals seem to damage tissue and cause some autoimmune inflammatory response. So another reason why a plant-based diet may help with a series of inflammation, even autoimmune conditions, um, just because you're decreasing inflammatory levels. Some other sources of dietary inflammation are endotoxins, found, of, which meaning uh, inside uh, a toxin. So we're finding like parasites, uh, f- funguses, uh, all kinds of uh, bac- bacteria, infections, animals basically that are sick uh, being uh, put into our food stream. And so uh, only just found in animal products or if that is cross-contaminated, uh, some plant foods possibly, <clears throat> but will lead to feelings of depression and isolation. Uh, limiting animal products uh, and increasing antioxidants seem to help. Anti-inflammatory diet for depression is an excellent video to watch on that one. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions on depression? Uh, basically, uh, treating liver zones uh, and then uh, headache type areas. Good. Anxiety stress. Keep rolling along here. So, psychological and uh, physiological arousal of the body. So you can actually measure the amount of anxiety somebody has physiologically. They will have literally motor tension all over their body. So those patients that come in, like no matter what you do, they're always tight. That may just be the anxiety going on in them. It actually physically manifests as tight muscle, motor tension, autonomic hyperactivity. So you'll get autonomic responses. Um, excessive worry, increased uh, vigilance, just constant go, 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 right? Um, Some risk factors are medical illnesses like heart disease lead to this anxiousness, anxiety, which is interesting that a physical heart condition leads to a emotional heart 
Chinese medically Shen type anxiousness, right? That's interesting that there's the, there is a there is a physical tie between the physical and the and the Shen. Uh, often concurrent with depression, so you often get that both. They're depressed and then they're anxious when they do have to go do something, right? Medication can induce, of course, and uh, drug intoxication, of course, and withdrawal. So if you're in the withdrawal world, uh, post-acute withdrawal syndrome, et cetera, lots of anxiety with these patients. Basically, to diagnose, they're looking for excessive anxiety and worry for more than six months. Uh, there's a restlessness and a fatigue at the same time. Uh, concentration's hard, irritability, muscular tension, and a sleep disturbance. <clears throat> Many possible pulses, but in general, you're going to find tight, wiry, maybe slippery pulses, more the wiry, tight pulse. But some patients, you'll feel a depressed pulse, and they're all wired up and anxious. Uh, but typically, you'll find that wiry pulse uh, with a wiry, wiry patient. Uh, liver channel organ again, same like before, like the depression. And we're looking at the zones. So just like after the heart condition, you might have actually anxiety. The heart zone may show up, which again, the heart zone being just under the xiphosternal notch, right? Just under the xiphosternal notch is our heart area, maybe up and under a little bit to the uh, left on the heart area, right? The heart kind of more towards center, but a little bit left. So up and under that direction is a little bit more physical heart, more emotional heart. So we're looking at that zone as well as true liver zone over the liver itself and the crossing liver zone. Tight tenderness uh, is what we're looking for. And then the treatments for those, again, uh, same side liver four, spleen five area, or uh, heart zone getting PC, uh, kind of REN 17, yeah, REN 15 maybe. <clears throat> Not so much COG, but more like 15. <clears throat> uh, meds are typically give. Talk therapy, of course, would be a preference of mine personally, uh, less drugs. There's a Dr. B uh, Bregan, I think it's B-R-E-G-G-I-N that has a whole series of books. He's a psychiatrist, so med prescribing doctor. Uh, let's see if I can get his name, Bragg in. Uh, and he is uh, not interested in using meds and really likes the talk therapy. So uh, he's got books like uh, Talking Back to Prozac, that kind of thing. So a good guy to look up if you're interested in that thing. He also has lectured extensively for um, uh, other um, series um, doctors that uh, put on uh, various kinds of uh, uh, forums and he goes and lectures so he's on YouTube and uh, yeah very nice fascinating guy <clears throat> avoiding caffeine alcohol and drugs for these patients uh, obviously caffeine is going to hype them up even more alcohol is going to alter those mood states a lot drugs of course are going to do all kinds of different things uh, relaxation techniques. So self-hypnosis is a very nice, very, uh, you talk yourself down into a nice relaxed state. Very wonderful. I usually do it in a way, uh, almost like as a meditative state in some groups that we're part of when we're doing a, a short meditation at the beginning of our, say, Tao Te Ching class or something. And we'll uh, talk through each part of the body and relax it consciously spot by spot. Maybe start at the toes. Okay, relax your toes. Let your feet fall into the floor, et cetera, et cetera. And, and just kind of work your way up every part of the body that you know the name for, which might take a while <laughs> if, if you're up on your anatomy. Uh, and then as you get to the, by the time I get to my head, usually I'm so relaxed, I'm almost asleep. Uh, but uh, it's a very nice way of really relaxing quickly. Uh, but uh, anything that gets people to, um, to breathe deeply, right, and get a very nice deep uh, lower diaphragmatic breathing. Excellent idea there, Mr. Duane. Uh, meditation, of course, exercise, whatever whatever puts them in a relaxed state for them. Maybe it's a bath with a glass of wine. Great. Uh, but uh, low alcohol wine, maybe, <laughs> since we're trying to avoid the alcohol in these cases. And stopping smoking also. Channels very similar to before. So brain areas, uh, gallbladder, bladder, uh, triple warmer, GV, right? Very similar points to last time. In these cases, here's the Sushin Song uh, listed with a four-needle combo. I'll describe this, the nine-needle version uh, when we get to uh, brain areas, and we're doing neurological, but we're getting into neurological quick here. Um, also added in here, maybe on me on. I do like on me on, um, usually for sleep, but uh, I find it useful in these anxiety-type cases as well. Of course, the ear points, Shenman heart liver. 
if you want to do a full 5NP NADA protocol, that's great too. So, uh, but uh, the the Shenmue Heart uh, specifically are are great. So I like those two as combination, and then um, usually liver's the next one because that's kind of the pent up kind of stuff. Uh, but if if kidney shows a bunch of deficiency, I'll hit kidney with it. Um, usually the uh, um, the um, you know, neurasthenia kind of point can be used as well. Neurasthenia on the ear is sort of at the where the earlobe meets kind of halfway along its juncture to the tragus right at the edge of the ear. I like that neurasthenia point. Sometimes I use that for, for sleep as well. When we talk about sleep, I might bring that up. Again, the calm formulas, calm and calm extra strength, extra special. Passion flower, chamomile, and lemon balm seem to be benzodiazepine uh, receptor um, activators. So, so they have literally uh, benzo actions, but the actions are sort of modest. But there is some action, so they are beneficial. Uh, kava, again, used quite a bit uh, when we when I first started uh, in this whole, uh, natural medical field, but uh, shown to have some liver toxicity in the last number of years. So that's sort of reduced in its uh, usage. I would, I would be careful with it. We were just in Fiji last year on the way to teach in Australia, and they were still drinking a lot of kava in Fiji. They were having kava ceremonies right there at the hotels and uh, singing songs and having a great time. Um, it wasn't real strong stuff as far as I could tell. I drank a couple of glasses of it, and um, I didn't get much. Uh, inositol seems to have some good use as an effective SSRI with less side effects, 12 to 18 grams a day. I was trying to look up inositol strong foods, and uh, some of the strongest ones I could find only had uh, maybe like orange juice was pretty high. Some uh, uh, great northern beans were high, but uh, the, the strength wasn't that much. It was only like 500 milligrams um, in like a half a cup. So you'd, I mean, what was that, eight, nine cups a day of, of, of great northern beans to get the effect of a of an, and then all tied up in the fiber, who knows? So it looks like you're going to have to get the extract and not really from food. But you might get a small effect eating a high inositol diet. I think that's been tried, uh, not not knowing if that's had much effect. Lavender has some really good effects, actually, on anxiety and stress. Uh, and in studies, it looks great. Um, the aromatherapy effect of it is useful and has shown effective studies. The ingestion of the oils actually has an equivalent effect to Valium, on a double-blind placebo study. That's fascinating. So I actually started carrying uh, just uh, essential oil of lavender in our office. And what I would do is uh, give patients a little small jar of it with a dropper and send them home with it uh, with a little bag of uh, empty gel caps and have them just drop uh, four or five drops, maybe up to 10 drops in, in their little gel cap, cap it, and just swallow the capsule. Seems that the oil um, is a little bit harsh on the stomach lining for some of my patients, but uh, really no side effects or uh, addictions to it. Uh, it has an estrogenic effect, though, meaning we need to be careful with men because uh, it does seem to lower uh, their active testosterone. For more information on that, see Dr. Greger, but... Um, you know, uh, I think we, Young Life was the one we were using, but uh, there's a whole bunch of brands. Just try to get a really clean one that is edible, right? You want one that, that uh, you can eat. Uh, 41 ratio, myonositol, myonositol, that's supposed to, PCOS and insulin resistance. Thanks, Mayo, for that. Um, yeah, food grade, right, exactly. Yeah, some people have allergies to it, right? And there is some... Um, I think it was, yeah, sorry, Young Living. doTERRA, uh, we've also used doTERRA, yep. And there's ingestible lavenders you can find. Oh, there's one, uh, Integrative Therapeutics, nice. Oh, they actually have a soft gel version. Oh, that's great. Thanks for chiming in, everybody. Um, the one I saw in the health food store a while ago seemed really expensive, so that's why we started carrying one. And um, it's really inexpensive stuff if you just put it in your own gel cap. So... Um, but again, I did have a couple people that were having, like, they started to get, to get burning sensations uh, after a few weeks. But boy, does it drop the anxiety rate right off. It's amazing. So especially as a, as a temporary, while they deal with their whatever life issue is, is creating this anxiety in their life, as a temporary fix, I think it's a great, it's a great way to go. I, I like giving it to patients.
So ingestible lavender, love it. Um, probiotics seem to have an effect. Uh, the gut is often called the second brain. Tons of nerve endings in the gut. <clears throat> and a uh, hundred times more contact with the outside world than our skin has. Ah, that, that statistic kind of blew me away. Um, psychotropic qualities uh, in probiotics, you get anxiety, depression, anger, and hostility effects uh, when you eat probiotics. It has a brain calming effect. There, may, I, there are even probiotic brands that, that make a specific you know, anxiety stress related probiotic. So that's very interesting. Um, I will look up Snow Lotus. Thank you for that, Wendy. Awesome. On we go. Uh, music, relaxing. <laughs> this was interesting. They did a study on, on how relaxing is music, and it is better than benzos. Wow. Uh, but it has to be Mozart. Um, and you get less allergic reactions. So that means that people that were listening uh, to calming music had less allergic reactions to food, to uh, environment, to respiratory allergies. Oh, that's fascinating. Amazing. Music is medicine, uh, but specifically with Mozart. Isn't that interesting? Let's go back and watch Amadeus. I liked that movie. Okay. Oh, we go to insomnia. I think we're still on the roll here. We've got a few more, a little while left before our next breakage. So on we go. Insomnia, so sleep, right? Basically, difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or feeling restored after sleep. 10% uh, of uh, the patients are uh, chronically that way. Uh, risk factors are being a female, sorry, uh, being divorced, widowed, or separated also leads to can't sleep. Um Increases with age, depression, anxiety, and stress lead to lack of sleep, of course. Stimulants, steroids, and antidepressants lead to lack of sleep. Didn't know about the steroids part. Um, as far as, you know, a patient on, say, a, a steroid uh, treatment, you know, prednisone or something. I didn't know that disturbed their sleep. I'll have to ask the next ones that come in if their sleep has been bothered by it. Uh, Allopathic-wise, uh, they're looking at history. Sleep apnea testing, of course, is common these days. And they're doing labs for endocrine disorders to see if there's a problem there. Many possible pulses. Of course, uh, we could try to tune in to our heart uh, channel organ looking for Shen-type uh, symptoms. So that is a spot we might go looking for kind of deep, weak. Or you might have a wired rapid uh, keeping you from sleeping, right? You could go either way on that. Uh, no sleep at 40. Ugh, darn. I've never had to take it, Karen. I don't know about prednisone for um, with sleep. Uh, and then, again, heart zone being right up there under that Xiphosteronauts kind of C15 area. Great. Sleep hygiene seems to be something that is important for these patients. So regular exercise. Get yourself nice and tired uh, before it's time for bed. Uh, avoid caffeine, obviously, especially in the later part of the day. Smoking, daytime naps, obviously, is going to uh, mean you're not going to be as tired at night. So, gosh, I didn't sleep last night. I'm really tired today. I'm just going to take a quick nap. Yeah, not so great because if everyone, everybody's gone through jet lag when you're traveling and teaching a little bit, um, the quicker you can get on. In fact, I try to get on the schedule of the new place I'm going before I even leave, if I can, I start adjusting my schedule a couple hours if I can, uh, you know, and then the kids, of course, because uh, they'll keep me up if if uh, <laughs> if they're not sleeping, right? Uh, limiting alcohol, of course, as well. Talk therapy can help because a lot of these patients are having other emotional issues. Uh, phytotherapy and chronotherapy, waking up time and getting light at the right time. There's actually a whole bunch of studies on, on how uh, you can... Um, use light as a therapy to stimulate your body's own uh, melatonin production, and that seems to alter the sleep pattern. So phototherapy, actually very useful. So getting in the right time zone and then getting full spectrum light early in the morning uh, sets up your clock to sleep better. Uh, warm baths, of course, anything relaxing. Warm baths are a little bit relaxing, and uh, there are various, of course, medications. Acupuncture treatment-wise, 
Um, we're treating that heart zone and, of course, head and brain. Uh, of course, this area, interesting, with our anatomical correlations, right? We've got on the on here basically right around G gallbladder channel, gallbladder 12, gallbladder 20 area seems to be a sleep area. Interestingly enough, heart 7, uh, head, neck, uh, there's the neck level. The crease right at heart 7 is going to be the crease at the neck, heart opposite clock with gallbladder. It lines up exactly at on the on and gallbladder 12. Very interesting. So uh, not only so that means maybe anything that stimulates this area uh, will treat sleep, right? So that got me thinking. What else stimulates that spot? Well, gallbladder channel treats itself. Gallbladder channel uh, head uh, at the foot, ankle at the uh, neck. Gallbladder forty might be a useful spot. So gallbladder forty to me is just as useful uh, as heart seven in treating sleep and slumber and on me on. They're actually, I always forget the name. There's a name of the spot that on me on is hitting. If anybody, please somebody who knows their anatomy better than me of the neck. Uh, but there's a barrel receptor, am I right? That you kind of hit with that point, which is kind of like, it's sort of the knockout point, I guess. If it is struck hard, like say in boxing, bang, it's like a lights out spot. Uh, somebody might know that spot. Somebody's typing, they may type it right in there, but um, there, there is some a mechanical sort of spot that has a trigger for sleep, which is maybe how that on me on is working, and these other points for that matter. Um, <clears throat> of course, classic, your, your uh, liver 3 li 4 combo, uh, anything that relaxes the muscles in the upper back and neck, so we've got uh, spleen 6, liver 5, uh, heart 4 area, something to relax these muscles. Uh, yeah, mastoid process is there. I'll have to look up that sleep receptor in the neck. Let me see if I can get back to that while we're on a break. So let me do a quick search for me. Sorry, I got to stretch a little bit there. Uh, yin Tong, of course, I love it. On me on. Uh, small intestine 8. That's uh, I'm going to have to remember why I put that in there. Bladder channel. Oh, eye level. Yeah. It's doing a bladder channel at the eye level. I think I'm trying to get something sort of around the face there with small intestine 8. Heart 3, 7, yin tong, good. Shenmian heart kidney. There's the neurasthenia point and oxaput. oxaput. So uh, neurasthenia again, where the earlobe meets. Uh, let's see if I still have the... Ah, yes, I do. The ear chart... So, let's see if we can zoom in. External ear thirst. Oh, oh, there it is. Wow, it's much lower on this chart. I always learned it higher. On this chart, neurasthenia is here on the earlobe. I always learned it up where the ear basically meets at the juncture. Uh, so maybe there's various charts. Not sure about that or if I've just had it wrong for a while. Uh, if anybody else can chime in where they're, where they're doing neurasthenia. But neurasthenia plus the occiput point, which is going to be kind of at the base of the neck, base of the head there. Uh, those two, two points I often like using specifically for if uh, the patient is waking up at night versus can't fall asleep. So I, I sort of differentiate a little bit on which ear points I'm doing. So Shenman, heart, kidney, on me on if they're not falling asleep. And then if they do fall asleep, but then they wake up during the night, I like the neurasthenia occiput combination. Oh, occiput being, uh, again, another area to treat this spot. So that occipital point, useful just like on me on, heart seven, gallbladder 40, all kind of focusing on that same area of, uh, of sleepiness. Might depend on the length of the earlobe. Okay, Nancy, could be. Herbal treatment-wise, we've got uh, Shazandra's Sleepy, Sleepy, Sleepy. It's a spleen heart formula, similar to something like uh, maybe a Guipi Tong. Calm's uh, more of a liver formula. So it's like your calm formula, Shaiyawan, add the sleepy stuff in it. That's a nice version. I like that combo. A lot of patients have that kind of eh, pent up. They need the Shaiyawan, but they also need that kind of sedation to go down at night. Tin Wan Bushindan is a, a commonly used formula. There's also a formula called Salvian Amber, 
from uh, Seven Forests that I like because of the hoopo that's in it. Let me see if I included a little bit of uh, I did. So here's a little uh, formula that um, was commonly going around Ocom dispensary uh, many a year ago. I think Dr. Jin might have come up with this one. Hong Jin. Uh, so Fu Xiao Mai, which is that floating wheat. Don Chen Hupo, Swan Zhao Ren, Longu, uh, heavy settling, dragon bone. I love telling patients they're getting dragon bone in their formula. They're just like, dragon bone? Where'd you even get that stuff? Love it. Uh, Anshen, yeah, Anshen is another good formula. Good to you. Uh, and then Shonji on dots out to help digest the whole thing. I find that hupo can be harsh on the digestion. Uh, in fact, many of these herbs can be. So uh, a lot of these patients have a hard time digesting it. So um, be careful with that. Add more digestive herbs as needed. Excessive coffee, alcohol, uh, physical inactivity seem to be things that uh, are leading these patients to not sleep. Avoiding milk also seems to benefit. Um, I don't know why that was. We might get a little bit more of that information as we go along. Carbohydrate-rich food seems to help, which is great. And avoiding weight loss products, which are, of course is souping you up. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Iron supplementation. Uh, uh, reduced levels are associated with restless leg, which of course could be what's keeping somebody up is their legs are just restless and got to get up and move and walk around and then I can finally go to sleep. So sometimes iron supplementation can benefit these patients if that's, uh, but it's worth checking. You don't want to have too much high iron, right? That's a problem as well. Melatonin seems to be especially helpful in shift workers that aren't sleeping um, at at night because they're working at night, right? Uh, and then daytime, they're trying to sleep and the light's out. And so that's that sort of phytotherapy again, right? So when the day, when the lights are out uh, on, uh, it's stimulating your, your melatonin production. So these patients, which aren't getting um, melatonin production because they're sleeping during the day, and maybe it's the wrong kind of light in the workplace, uh, taking melatonin seems to really help them and elderly patients also, uh, whereas the rest of us, uh, it doesn't really show as well on the studies. Valerian at four to 500 milligrams a day seems uh, useful, but there are some dangerous interactions, so we want to be careful with it. Looks like one in three adults have insomnia. Seven to eight hours of sleep seems to be associated with longer life, better memory, and better immune function. So, uh, the problem seems to be if you're getting too much beyond the nine hours or less than seven hours, the, those put you in, uh, we talked earlier yesterday about that, uh, those put you in a higher, uh, worse immune system, basically. You get colds easier, higher, higher rates of, of infections and colds if you're having um, too little sleep or too much sleep, whereas uh, that middle range seems to be perfect uh, overall. Everybody varies a little bit. Uh, production of melatonin decreases with age. That's probably why giving melatonin to um, patient, elder patients seems to help. Uh, Melatonin-rich foods are helpful. So there was a, uh, Gregor's got a series on uh, melatonin-rich foods, specifically using melatonin for jet lag, which seems useful. And so uh, there are some foods that are higher in melatonin. And uh, pistachios, amazingly, seem to be really high, uh, like off the chart high. But don't in the raw form, so if they're toasted, good luck. Uh, you're not getting much, but if you're good. So uh, where do you find raw pistachios? Well, online. I actually found bags of them in Trader Joe's, so you can get raw pistachios in Trader Joe's. Uh, chamomile seems useful, but be careful with pregnancy. Um, digested in foods, uh, it can get to the brain. So melatonin digestion in foods can get to the brain. Uh, tart cherries show a little bit of a benefit. Almonds have more. Raspberries have more. Goji berries, good old gochitsa, is loaded with melatonin. So give people a handful of, uh, of goji berries in their evening uh, snacks and um, see if their insomnia changes. Worth a try, right? Great. We did... Uh, psychological sections. Wonderful. We're pretty much really close to our next break. Um, where are we getting to today? I wanted to get into neurological before we finish up by lunch. So um, we're pulling those up. Can we take? Should we take a quick break before that and then push on through to lunchtime? Go 
Cheats of Lemonade. Do you have a recipe for that, Hannah? I'd like to see it. Yeah, I want no. I want to know more too. That was a sneaky little. Hey, go cheats of lemonade. There's our neuro stuff. We're gonna cover MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and stroke. All right, let's do a ten this time. Let's come back at what eleven forty-five or so. How's that sound? 